E A G L E S. Eagles. What's up, everybody? Welcome on in. Appreciate you hanging with us. That is Tone Shields. I am Rob Ellis on this uh, glorious Friday. Tone, how we doing, my man? Oh, man, I'm doing great, man. You know, it's Friday, Freaky Friday. I'm, I'm super excited about the weekend, man. Um, Just happy to happy to be alive, man. Feels good. You look good. I feel good, man. Let's, <laughs> let's have a good show. Smelling good, feeling good. Uh, you, you, know how, you know how we get down over here, man. I know, I know, I know what's up. All right, so hi to everybody. What's up, Rye Guy, Flexing and Stepping, Twiz, Jason, I'm awake. Father Sean checking in. What's up, Father Sean? Uh, James, William, Lucy, Decoy, uh, KJG. Who did I, who did I miss? Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. I don't think so. So everybody's doing good. That's good. It's good to see everybody. Uh, uh, all right. So a couple things to, uh, to dive into today, kind of a jump around, uh, to start the show. We have Mike Sealski joining us at 1130. Mike's got a, uh, a good piece today on, uh, what Penn state should do with their, in terms of naming their stadium and whether or not they should name it, uh, Joe Paterno stadium, but he was also at the Super Bowl last week. He's obviously up to speed on everything that's going on, uh, with Hassan Reddick. We'll bounce Phillies, Sixers, Flyers off of them, uh, and all that. So speaking of Flyers, uh, lost last night tone to the Leafs. They were down three, one in the third period, fought back, tie it, uh, to go to overtime. And then they lost uh, pretty quickly into the OT. Now it snapped a four game winning streak, but uh, it keeps their point streak alive at five straight games since they got to overtime in that bad boy on the road. So they're 29, 19 and seven. And uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this game tomorrow night. They play in the stadium series at MetLife stadium where the giants and jets play outdoors at eight o'clock tomorrow night. That's going to be cool. Yeah. You were telling me about that. And I was like, wait, is that the, uh, is that the uh, what do we call it? The the, the, the winter classic, and you were yeah, like, no, it's, no, it's actually, like a derivative, it's something of new. It's something yeah. new, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, the, the first thing I thought about was, wow, the NBA needs to probably adopt something like that. You know, play some games outside and really get fans, you know, invigorated. You know what I mean? You know, maybe on the West Coast or maybe somewhere yeah. down south. I think San Diego will probably be a good way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere where the weather is you know more stable. But um, but yeah, man, look, they lost last night, but at the same time, I I was still encouraged by just. The fight, right? And again, they're yeah. a young team. They're a team that's still developing. You know, they've given us many highs this season. They've given us a few lows in between. But overall, sure. I think this season is, has given us a lot to be optimistic when it comes to the Flyers in their future. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And, and I, I think there's uh, you know, going to be, like we talk about, the trade deadline is March 8th. So it's mm-hmm. pretty soon. Um, and they have guys like Scott Lawton, who's been talked about maybe being traded, mm-hmm. who has really played well for them. That, it's going to be, it's a hard thing. It's kind of counterintuitive when you think about it. Like, you're mo- you're, you would move somebody like that for the future. Mm-hmm. But when you're playing as well as you're playing right now, it's you are taking away from your team in the immediate you know time period. Yeah. So there is a little part of the competitor in you that's like, man, are we, why are we getting rid of this guy? Right. But but ultimately, you know what you're doing with the with the the thought is and what the plan is. And I think the Flyers are going to stick with that plan. And I think they should stick with that plan. Yeah, I think they should too. Um, It's real easy to get caught up in the winning and to think that you're more, you're further along than what you really are. But um, I admire the patience of the organization. Um, Briere, um, our guy, uh, geez. Keith Jones. Keith Jones, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I almost said Kenny Jones. Damn, Mm -hmm. I'm glad Kenny Jones sounds like a country singer. But nonetheless, Keith I Jones. Thought, or, or, or <laughs> Kenny Jones could go either country singer or like a really good, you know, football or basketball player. Right, 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 right. Kenny yeah, Jones could work a couple different ways. But yeah, yeah, shout out to our guy, Keith Jones, man. Um, look, the fact of the matter is they're, they they should remain patient and they should build this thing right, not fast. Agreed. All right, so there's that. Uh, Sixers all-star break. They need it. I mean, let's face it, a lot of walking wounded, a lot of guys down right now. Embiid's the headliner. But beyond that, it's Melton, it's Batum, it's Tobias Harris. You know, we've been we've been through this. Now you've seen the nice thing is we heck flex it and step and says Kenny Jones could be a rapper's name back in the 90s. Yes. Uh, what, the, the good thing is we've seen potentially what this could be if all these guys can play together. You know, Buddy Heald's been very good since they got him he has he has really helped them campaign it's been kind of up and down he wasn't great the other night right. but he had his moments uh as well but you think about even in the interim without Embiid, 
if you have those guys, right, and and they can provide and just kind of keep you afloat, because really that's ultimately what you're looking to do. You're looking to stay right. afloat here with this with this bunch and not dip into that play in tournament. I think they can do now that from what I've seen, my fear was tone that they were really going to kind of fall out and fade out of this thing. Right. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they're going to be okay. Not yeah, really okay. I think I think they're going to hang around that five, six, seven spot. Yes, I, you want to avoid the play in, so you want to hang around that five, six spot at the at the very worst. Mm-hmm. But they're 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 going to make the playoffs. They're, they're too well coached. Um, with Tyrese Maxey, they're holding down the fort. And you got some guys around them that can actually shoot the ball and put the ball on the floor, like a Buddy Hill. I think it really helps. You know, so far Buddy Hill's been making big contributions. I think he's um since the trade. How many points is he averaging, Rob? He's been good. I'll tell you the other thing that's impressed me. He's been better at putting it on the floor. Uh, that I anticipated. It hasn't just been, hey, stick him in a corner and let's feed him and just spot up. You know, he's done a little right. bit more than that. Um, you know, the ability to come off a screen ha- has been nice as well. Um, no, I like I like what we're what, what they're getting out of him. And I think that it, it when you have a coach like Nick Nurse too, I, that was one of the things that Nurse said the other day. He said after the All Star break, you know, we're going to get some more of these guys back. We anticipate a bunch of them coming back, and then I can really kind of you know, get my hands in there and kind of move things around a little bit and get in the lab and, you know, and see how this works. And that's what Daryl Morey said the other day too, uh, you know, when he spoke. And this is where you feel good about having a guy like Nurse as opposed to Doc Rivers, who we'll talk about later, you know. And then as William points out, you know, they'll be adding Kyle Lowry uh, as well. We know he's not the same player that he was mm-hmm. athletically, but, we, you know, there, you can make up for a lot of things with smarts, you know, with toughness and as – um you know, as Nick Nurse said the other day, he's the toughest competitor that he's ever coached. So that, right. that you know, that's saying something. Uh, you know, yeah. By, so, by Kyle so, buddy, through four games, um, through thirty-nine minutes played, averaging twenty-two points per game. Yeah, um, I mean, about four rebounds, that. seven assists, mm-hmm. about seven, seven and a half assists, almost two steals. You got to give credit where credit is due. He's coming in and he's making an instant contribution. He's he's providing instant offense, taking a lot of pressure on Tyrese Maxey, um, allowing him to space the floor. And again, this is. We, it's going to be really interesting to see how they all commingle when Embiid comes back. Obviously, Heald's role is going to uh, decrease. Yeah, he won't be scoring at that rate. The right. field goal attempts won't be at that rate. Right, right, right. But the fact of the matter is that confidence is coming up. Mm-hmm. He can feel that he's getting comfortable in his new situation. Right. And pr- probably when Embiid comes back, you're going to see, you're going to see him hanging around that corner a lot more. Right. But which is fine. That, that's which is good. fine. Which is yeah. fine. But even then, though, the, to have the ability to put the ball on the floor to create your own three point shot, we've seen him do that a few times too—a step back or a crossover mm-hmm. there, a pull up off the dribble. Uh, he's so far so good, man. Through four games, uh, I like what I'm seeing from Buddy Hill for sure. Me too. Me too, man. So I'm excited to see what the second half looks like, and you know, everything's. We all know. You know, the one thing I was thinking about this too. We we always make reference to this with the Flyers. Like you got a lot of hungry guys who have a lot to prove, right? Mm-hmm. Think about the Sixers team, other than Embiid, and we know Maxie's going to be here. But other than that, it's essentially every guy is showcasing himself. You know, whether you want to stay in the league or whether you want to get, you know, another big payday, you know, whatever, there's a lot of motivation for these guys to play well in this second half, whether, you know, and that certainly, you know, applies to the team, but for mm-hmm. these guys individually too. So you're going to get everything that they have here to close out the rest of the season. So, you know, we'll Absolutely. see. We'll see. But I'm looking forward to seeing Maxi play with it with you know some of the stars of the league. Yeah, it's gonna be cool, man. Uh, that's gonna be fun. Uh, all right, uh, Phillies are, are in the midst of uh, pitchers and catchers, but most of the squad is down. Not, not everybody, but a lot of guys are down there. Brandon Marsh. This was encouraging. Uh, he had he had his knee scope just six days ago, and he said he feels great. Uh, he said it, it, in as soon as the all the swelling goes down in that knee. He feels like he's going to be right back to where he was, and he has no doubt right now that he's on time to be ready for the uh, for the start of the season. So that's good. And I think it's 28th of March uh, is the opener uh, this year. So, you know, he's got about a month and change. Yeah, he'll be fine. Mm-hmm. He'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, not worried about that. This, the scopes now, man, they're so amazing with that kind of stuff. He, and he said it wasn't a big deal. It was the It was the most – it was best-case scenario when they went in that there was so little to do. It was just a little mm. clean up and, you know, get out. Um, all right, I want to throw a name at you. Tell me if it interests you, all right? Okay. Eddie Jackson. Safety with the Bears. Been around for a while. Been a very good player during his time in Chicago. Uh, seven seasons, two Pro Bowls. He was an All-Pro in 2018. Here's the, here's the fear. Here's the downside. 30 years old. 
last three years has seen his season cut short with foot injuries. Mm-hmm. He's basically played 12 games, uh, the, you know, averaged about 12 games over the last three years. Older dude, foot injuries. Now, he did, he was there with Vic Fangio. So their paths did cross. So there's a relationship there. And we know how certain coaches have a comfort zone with certain guys, you know, and they look to bring them in. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Hmm. I, I, I'm leery. I'm leery of the of the injuries. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because he historically, you know, had a pretty decent injury history. Or he played he played games. You know, he averaged about 16 games yeah. per season, and then these past couple of years, 12 games back to back seasons. Kind of kind of reminds you of Dallas Goddard, right? right. Uh, and then in 2021, he had 14 games played. So there's clearly a level of deterioration. Um, and if it's the same nagging injury, that kind of concerns me a bit. Um, I don't question his ability. Um, he's shown an ability to play at a Pro Bowl level. He's shown an ability to play at a, at a first-team All-Pro level. Um, that was earlier in his career. But, you know, in 2022, he had four interceptions last year. He only had one. Um, uh, both seasons, he averaged about five and a half uh, pass deflections. Um, he knows how he, could, he, he he can force some fumbles. He's he's he has active hands. So look, Eddie Royals a, you know he he was he was a good player. Um, I think I think because of the injury that drops him down to an okay player. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you think about the age factor, we're trying to get we're clearly trying to get younger. We're trying to get faster. And when you're right. dealing with nagging foot injuries, um, how explosive can you be? Um, how much of a playmaker can you be? Um, you know, planting off that foot that continues to bother you. So. Um, it's an interesting name, but I think I'd rather pass. Again, I'm trying to get younger right. and uh, more athletic back there. Uh, yeah. By my estimation, it sounds like another Kevin Byer situation. That I was just going to – man, it's funny. I was just going to use that name. Uh, it's probably not fair to Eddie Jackson, but I – after what last year, with, you know, with, with trying to roll out, you know, Shaq Leonard mm. and Kevin Byard and, you know, Mora was okay. I, I just – I don't feel like going down that road again, man. I, I, I know. Really, I don't. Yeah, and I think that they there's there's been too many like I don't know, man. We, we it it has worked a couple of times. We know it worked like a charm in 2017 with some of the older cats, but it feels like the last couple of years you don't want to be you know continuing to go down that road. Uh, yeah, for sure. you know, and again, I think he'll catch on somewhere. I don't think he's cooked, but um, I I'd probably rather go younger and, and a little bit more a uh, guy with some more durability that I mm-hmm. know has that durability. Uh, all right, let me give a give a mid segment check in and say hi to, to some folks who jumped on uh, a little bit later. Say hi to everybody, Jimmy. What's up, man? Jimmy's good uh, good viewer here. Bry, I already said hi to Bry William. I think I got you as well. If I missed anybody, I'm sorry. There's more folks here. Chuck, what's up, Chuck? What is up, uh, Fitness Rebel? How you doing? Uh, who else do we have here? I think I, I got most folks. If I didn't get you, uh, my apologies. All right, Rob. So, let me ask, let me ask you this really quickly. Yeah. Have you ever been out and about, you know, just running errands or doing, you know, lifing? Um, have you ever run into someone that says, hey, aren't you that sports tech guy? Yes. Hey, aren't you that guy on WIP? Yes. Now, Rome, what's up? Yes, I have. So, you know what happens? I get that just like, hey, they'll recognize whatever the face. I get yeah. that sometimes. The weirdest thing, the weirdest thing is like you're at a deli and you're ordering. I have a you know half a pound of imported ham whatever back when back when you can actually afford meat uh before <laughs> meat was insanity but you do that and, and somebody just kind of whips around and they're like that voice that voice you're 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 that guy or whatever like uh, you know, that, that that yeah get a lot it's cool though it's the I think thing. I think that's more cool than noticing noticing my face I agree with you that has more of an impact like the face thing yes it, it is neat but the the voice means something something's clear yeah yeah that that means that person is like that that person listens to you really yes um, I'll tell you I'll tell you what else is we I'll get I'll give you two really weird things yeah all right so when I used to do a lot more a lot of TV when I was with NBC Sports Philadelphia, they would replay things. Okay. Mm. So something I did during the week would be replaying on a Saturday. Right. And you go into like a restaurant or a bar and you know, you're, you're, I walked in one time to a place and I'm on, I'm on above the bar, above the bartender. Right. That and is like, funny. Oh, so it's a, a female bartender. I said, 
man, that dude on screen is handsome. You and said that? Yeah. And she looks at me and she's like, and then she's like, what the, what? Who are you? <laughs> she didn't know I was. Like, Who are you? <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. So I've done that before. Oh, or man. WIP sometimes will play best of and other, like, like okay. a replay of a show. Okay. And I remember one time I pulled up at a Wawa and I'm, I'm about to park to go in. And the car next to me, the guy sitting in there, he's like eating his, you know, donut or whatever, whatever you do, or drinking his coffee. And he's got a replay on of me from earlier in the week in, in his car. So that's it. Those things are kind of cool. When, it's funny you say that. Um, I was um, this is around the time where I was preparing to leave Philadelphia. Right. Mm -hmm. And me and the wife were at Home Depot grabbing some boxes and Home Depot is about the clothes. You know, there's not that many people in there. So um, I'm at the register. And you know, I'm going up, you know, I'm I'm going about my normal thing. The um for some reason the kiosk weren't working. So um I had to actually deal with the person. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm going through the whole transaction and the guy's like, Wait, you, you look familiar. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, um I live around the corner or something. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I live in a neighborhood yeah. or whatever, yeah. and he's like, No, 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 no. Wait. You're that guy that talks about the Eagles, right? On, on, on uh, what, 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 what is it? I'm like, oh, are, yeah. are you talking? Are you talking about on like YouTube and all that? He said, yeah. And he said, listen, man, what do you yeah. think we're gonna do? What do you think we're gonna do? What, what? I'm like, I look, man, I don't know, but you know, a lot can, a lot can happen, a lot can change, you know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. He's like, listen, man, I love what you're doing, man. I really, I really appreciate you, young that's guy. That's awesome. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That was the first that's time the I ever got noticed. Thing. Well, that's the kind of thing um, that helps keep you going when, when when oh, during the tough days sometimes right mm, that, yeah. that you know that 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 is uh that's cool yeah I, i'm glad yep. to hear that that that, that you experienced that because it's just, you deserve it um all right so a couple other things to hit here caitlin clark uh of iowa she becomes the all-time scoring leader in women's college basketball she dropped 49 on michigan she Ooh. outscored michigan in the first quarter by herself she had 23 in the first quarter <laughs> I mean, this, this she just is, is dominant, man. Game Very in, game out. Sharp shooter. I mean, just an electric player. I love, I, I love how much more attention, um, you know, woman hoops is getting. Big you time. know, and I, and I, and Prime I really, time games. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I really think it started because of that. Um, you know, that final, four, you know, those final four, you know, those those, those, those matchups, right? Yeah. You know, when Iowa and LSU went up against each other, man, that was it. it was just, it was. Box office, you know what I mean. You Big know time. the, uh, you know the the on court, the, the on court uh, rivalries, and just just the scoring, the competitiveness. It, it, it was just really awesome to see. So it's really it's really changed um, the way we perceive women's sports. Um, I feel like I feel like people are allowing women to really express themselves more um, because you know you know how it is sometimes when women are passionate, people call them something else. Uh -huh. And um, I think it's so dope just to see these women playing this sport and, and, and they got swagger. They got, they got an edge to them. You know what I mean? And it, it's, it's just dope to see. I agree with you. And I remember, you know, when uh, Caitlin Clark, I think it was uh, uh, Angel Reese were going at one another last year. You remember mm -hmm. all the, all the trash talk and all that. Yeah. Like, both of them were like, this is, this is this what, what we, we do. do. We're good. But every, so many other people were like, Oh my God. You know, the, what is the like? Right. Like you wouldn't have cared if that was men if two men were doing that, you know. know. And but I just love that they were like, "We're good. Like, don't worry about us." You, 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 that's that's whoever's got an issue. That's their problem, you mm -hmm. know. And I, and I thought they both handled it, uh, you know, very well. So that was cool. But I'm I I'm with you. I'm glad to see like what we saw last night. It's, that, that game was on Peacock too. Word. So okay. Yeah. Okay. They're even trying, you know, the, with the streaming services to pull that, you know, that audience there, awesome. you know, like we do, you know, we see with the NBA or NFL and, and, and whatnot. And, and Rob, man, if you really watch those games, because sometimes when, when I'm in the gym, they're playing them and I'm watching them while I'm either on a treadmill or on a bike or whatever. Yep. And let me tell you, those chicks can hoop. Yeah, man. They can put the ball on the floor. They're, cre they're creative because, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, physically they're not like man strong, right. but – you see so much more finesse. You see no much, more, so much more, um, you know, fundamentals and technique, and just the, their ability to just, yeah. yeah, they're 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 so creative with the, with the basketball, um, and again, they just play with a swagger and edge. I love it. Yeah, I, I absolutely. So that was cool last night. And then the other, they, I was kind of flipping around a little bit. The um, South Carolina and Tennessee was a good game too, and South Carolina beat them. South Carolina's undefeated, so. Yeah. 
They have a, my, my daughter who goes there, Tone, said you can't even get a ticket to those games, even as a student. Like she's been to one game this year, a one women's game. You can't even get in. It's so wow. crazy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing how it's what it's turned into, man. Where like not all that long ago you were you were begging people to go. It, it really, really was it really is. Uh it really is wild, man. All right. So um so we've got Mike Sielski coming up. One of the other things we're gonna do today at, at 12 o'clock. We're going to look at the history of the Eagles under Howie Roseman, essentially. We're, not, we're, only, we're going to go back as far as the end of the Andy Reid era and look at how they have quickly turned things around from year to year. So uh, my, the point of it is, yes, things look a little bit bleak right now um, when it comes to the Eagles, but the reality of the situation is that they have typically made really smart offseason a, you know, moves, whether it's the draft or free agency or trades, and they've gotten themselves right back into the picture because we're also later going to do our uh, AFC power rankings. I'll tell you what, man, and I'm not giving anything away. You, you know, we, it's, we, we were exactly on the same page yesterday, right. but the, for me, when I was doing it, the bottom five or four are so much better than the NFC. Like it's mm. not even close. My point is like you, you can get yourself back. I think relatively quickly. We know how good the Niners are. We know the total respect to Detroit, et cetera. But like, come on, man. Like you, this is not the the greatest conference that we've ever seen. That there's no chance that the Eagles can turn this thing around. I think they absolutely at all, at all. So again, um, see, here's the thing, though, right? So you're like you're, you're absolutely right. But when you see them lose to a Giants team that's clearly inferior, you see them lose to a Cardinals team that's clearly inferior. True. Sure. It, it gives you cause to pause, and you and you say to yourself, "Oh, this team can lose to anybody." Right. So, although you are right, you know they had to prove otherwise. Yes. And um, this is the time where you have to. This all see everything that we saw in 2023 was established in that off season. So again, going into the 2024 season, this off season is crucial. Harry Roseman, those guys had to do everything possible um, to give this team the tools. Uh, so they can go into the season confident and believe in what they're doing. Um, every game in the uh, trade at the trade deadline, a supplement your roster. Okay, add there, you know, do this. But you know, it seemed like Harry Roseman was trying to build his roster on the fly last year, Agreed. and and it, it it just didn't pan out. And when yeah. you're doing stuff like that, and when you're behind the a ball like that, your team is never going to be as successful as they should. All right, let's take a quick time out. Uh, we come back. Mike Sielski from the Philadelphia Inquirer is going to join us. We'll talk to Mike about a number of different things, uh, including the Eagles, including Super Bowl 58. Uh, right now, I want to tell you about Bravo Pizza of Havertown. Family owned since 1985, been going there since I was a kid. Uh, they have 20 different styles of pizza. They have slices to go. They have the you name it, they'll make it, specialized pizza your way. But they don't just do pizza. They do fresh pasta, sandwiches, wraps, wings, salads. Bravo Pizza of Havertown is also committed to the community. They have fundraisers for charities, for schools, for little leagues, where proceeds go to those organizations. You can follow them at the Bravo Pizza of on Instagram and Facebook for daily specials and promotions. They're located at 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center in Havertown, PA. 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center, Havertown, Pennsylvania. Give them a call, 610 610- 446-3810-610-446-3810. Bravo Pizza of Havertown. I remember getting my heart broken when they lost the Super Bowl in 2004. We were big Eagles fans. We moved to South Philly because of the Eagles. When they won, we went straight to Broad Street and uh, everybody was going nuts over there, and it was just a, a memory that you'll never forget. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. 
With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Happy Friday, friends. Welcome back in, everybody. We are Sports Take. That is Tone to Shields. I am Rob Ellis. Uh, joining us now, phenomenal columnist and author. Uh, you can check him out not only at inquirer.com, but on Twitter slash that <laughs> at Mike Sealski. Mike, are, have you recovered yet from Vegas? That's the first question. You've had now mm, five days, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. How are we doing physically? <laughs> Honestly, Rob, I didn't hit it real hard in Vegas. My body clock never got right from the moment I got there. I was waking up at six o'clock every morning there, meaning like 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. Eastern time. And I'm not a big gambler and I had a lot to do. So uh, I didn't spend a lot of time on the strip. Got to be honest. I, I was head down doing work, having a few nice dinners and then watching Patrick Mahomes pull another rabbit out of his hat. Next time you're on, Mike, I want you to lie. I want some really <laughs> salacious story. Okay, let, let's just. I wish I had a more exciting life for you, Rob. Yes. I know you want to live vicariously through me, but I'm. Just I do. Not I'm stuck here, man. Words. I need you to be doing some things. Okay, <laughs> one of us has to. Jeez. Oh, uh, so I let you down, pal. That's all right. That's all right. Always, so always good to see you, Mike. Always. Yeah. Let, too, let's, Mike, let's start there, man. I mean, we've seen it now. It's become commonplace for for Mahomes and Reed to just you know, come back in these games to deliver in the biggest of moments. He's got the it factor. We know that there is, you know, you know, if you give the guy even an inch, he's going to, he's going to take it and bury you. Um, I, I, tell me where you're at with this, because I, a lot of people are, are starting to go goat and I can't quite go there yet. But what I say is when he's done, we're, we could very well be talking about goat material. Where, where are you at with, let's just start with Mahomes, and then we'll get to Andy. Yeah, I think goat is possible, Rob. Uh, to me, this is another validation of what I think gets undersold when we talk about sports and under, under discussed when we talk about sports and teams' chances of winning championships, which is how much of a difference, quite literally, particularly in the NFL and in the NBA, one player can make. One mm. player changing the entire 
course and direction of a league, right? You saw it in the NFL in the year 2000 when, to, you know, nobody saw it coming, but with the sixth pick, in the sixth round with the 199th pick, the Patriots take Tom Brady and their organization and the entire league is going to be changed for the next 20 years because of that pick. And you see it when the Bulls get Michael Jordan or the San Antonio Spurs get Tim Duncan. And I think you're seeing it with Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs and the fact that the Chiefs got this guy. There's a ripple effect throughout the league because of just his presence. You're talking about now a team that's been to four of the last five Super Bowls and that has mm -hmm. won three of them and is now the the champ in a way that every other team in the league is saying, what do we have to do to beat them and that guy? And that changes the thinking and the approach for the Eagles, for the 49ers, for every other team that has a hope of trying to win a championship. It is how do you knock off Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs? And we can spend all this time talking about, you know, do the Eagles need to improve their linebackers or, you know, if the Sixers get Joel Embiid back healthy, what will that mean and all that kind of stuff? If you don't have that guy at that time, generally speaking, unless you catch lightning in a bottle like the Eagles did with Nick Foles, forget it. Mike, I'm so glad you uh, you you made that uh, segue easy because to me, I think this upcoming season through all the issues that we're talking about with the Philadelphia Eagles, no matter what, I always circle back to Jalen Hurts saying, listen, a lot can look different. A lot can change. A lot can be different if Jalen Hurts comes back a much sharper player. And look, Patrick Mahomes is the gold standard, maybe a standard no one can reach. He's in the league of his own. Best believe that. But again, I want to ask you, when it comes to Jalen Hurts, obviously coming off the rough season in 2023, how much of the onus is put on Jalen Hurts to really come back and be sharper than he's ever been? Yeah, I think a good bit of it, Tone, is on Jalen. I think a good bit of it is going to be on Kellen Moore uh, and the the play calling and the system and the strategies that he uses uh, to try to get the offense back to where it was in 2022. You know, I think we can overstate a little bit how much Jalen struggled in 2023. I mean, there were some games that he he pretty much carried the Eagles to victories. I'm thinking about Absolutely. the game against the Commanders in Landover. I'm thinking about the game against the Bills that he basically won in overtime and had a great game by himself. Um, so it wasn't all bad for Jalen, but I think we'd all agree that there's a level that he showed he can get to, and he didn't consistently get to that level last year. Uh, and so, yeah, some of this is going to be on him and to be better. Some of it is going to be on Kellen Moore. Some of it is going to be on the pieces around him. The offensive line wasn't quite as good in 2023 as it had been the season before. You know, it, when they went to the Super Bowl, they were clearly the best offensive line in the NFL, and they were not that last season. Doesn't mean they weren't good. It just means that if they regress a little bit, then everything else is going to regress with them. So it's never just the one thing, Tone. Does Jalen need to be better? Absolutely. Uh, but th there are other pieces and factors around him that need to improve as well. Uh, but let's stay on that, Mike. You know, the Hassan Reddick thing's been interesting. You know, Ian Rappaport comes out with the uh, with the initial uh, report on uh, Super Bowl Sunday, clearly from the Eagles side. <laughs> uh, and then he comes back and, and gets his point of view out there. So, I mean, here we are. Essentially, they've had conversations. They're not on the same page. The Eagles gave them permission to, to, to shop around a little bit here. Um, you're looking at a defense that's already pretty light talent-wise. He goes, uh, you know, that, that's yet another spot that you're going to have to fill, at least in the interim. What do you think happens here? Should they let him get out of town, or how do you view it? I think it's a really tough call, Rob. I would be more inclined to to pay Hassan Reddick to see if you can't strike some kind of deal with him to bring him back because he is a premium player at an incredibly important position and filling an incredibly important role for a team that considers itself a Super Bowl contender right now. The problem with that, and I'm, I'm not saying that it's a slam dunk that you do this. I think I would, but the problem is, is that it, if – they don't structure the deal the right way. It's probably going to create problems for them down the road. You still want to re-sign Devontae Smith, for instance. And presumably there are going to be other younger players coming along who you're going to want to keep. And if you're paying too much to a guy like Redick for who he was as opposed to who he is or might be, that's where you get yourself into problems, right? That's what they encountered this year by paying Darius Slay and James Bradbury the way that they did. Those guys did not perform to the level that they were being paid as top flight cornerbacks. 
And now you may have to say goodbye to at least Bradbury. Uh, Slay's a different story. So I think it's a tough call. I think they should bring him back. Uh, I think Reddick wants to be here. Mm -hmm. And I think if he's, I think he's of the mindset, just this is something I'm gleaning from talking to him a few times over the course of the season. I think if he feels like he's in the kind of system that can really maximize what his skills are, Mm -hmm. then he'll be fine coming back. Right. He wants to make the money. Yes. But he was clearly frustrated about how he was being used toward the end of that season, uh, with dropping back into coverage with doing things that he doesn't excel at. And he gets after quarterbacks and they need that in this, uh, in this defense. And so I, I'm more inclined to pay him, I think. Okay. You know, that, that's fascinating. That begs the question, you know, what's what's Vic Fangio's goal for this defense, right? Um, obviously, we've had guys in this building who've tried to mimic uh, what Vic Fangio does, but, you know, nothing's quite better than the source, right? So um, what are your expectations for Vic Fangio, especially knowing that the Philadelphia Eagles have legitimate personal issues on that side of the ball? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little more hesitant to be, okay, this is great. They've got a proven defensive coordinator in there now, Tone. And it's not just that we've seen, as you said, facsimiles of this defense uh, and it hasn't worked out as well. And it's not just that the Eagles seem to be lacking a good bit of talent uh, on that side of the ball. I worry, uh, and maybe this is never going to come to fruition, but I worry that the style of defense that Fangio prefers, don't give up the big plays, uh, you know, reduce chunk plays in the pass game is more vulnerable now or will be more vulnerable than it's been in the NFL in a long while. Mm. Look at the Chiefs and look at the 49ers. Look, the Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes, and he's practically a god on earth when it comes to playing the quarterback position. I get that. But Andy Reid's come around to running the ball a little bit. And running the ball is a big, big factor and plus on the 49ers side of their offense, right? You can make an argument that they didn't give the ball to Christian McCaffrey and their backs enough in that game, um, in that Super Bowl but they certainly can run the ball if they want to. And I, I wonder that what's happening in the NFL is that so many defenses are geared to stop the pass and are therefore built with smaller, faster defenders. The teams are eventually going to figure out, Hey, we can run the ball. We can, we can ram the ball down teams. Throats. Look at what the lions do. For instance, they can really run the ball. Well, and we saw this last season and the season before that, and the season before that with the Eagles, there were times where they couldn't get off the field because they couldn't stop an opposing offense from running the ball on them. And I just wonder if Fangio's defense is going to be the kind of defense that's going to thrive if and when other teams figure out that strategy, Mm -hmm. that you can run the ball in the modern NFL. And maybe in some situations, it's even preferable to run the ball in the modern NFL. And that's scary, Mike, the the whole figured out thing, because it's one of the things we talk about on the offensive side of the ball. You, you know, with this team. And if in fact they are bringing somebody in who it, potentially on the defensive side, that it, it could be at that point now with his system a, a, as well. So let's go to the other side, Kellen Moore. Um, you know, he's had, he's had success. There's no denying that it was ugly last year. I, I always say with tone, you, you know, you're looking at last year with that charger team, it was so chaotic and such a mess. I don't know what to make of it really, but what do you think about him and the whole resurrection? If you will, it's a little strong, but, but getting Jalen back on track, and getting this offense rolling, uh, bringing him in here. Yeah, look, um, in some ways, his track record is kind of a kaleidoscope, right? If you turn it a certain way, you can see what you want to see from it. Mm. Uh, you could you could say that he was terrific with the Cowboys, right? That he was kind of the engine behind their offense and helping Dak Prescott and that offense really become one of the top point-producing units in the NFL. But then he was gone last season, and the Cowboys' offense was still really good. Uh, so how much of it was him? Uh, you mentioned Rob that season in LA with the chargers. And I think you're right. I think there was so much chaos going on there. And Brandon Staley was so out of his depth, uh, that, you know, it's hard to draw any kind of conclusions from that. He, I think he's a solid, good offensive coordinator. Uh, and we're going to have to see exactly what he wants Jalen to do in this system. Right. I think, I think a lot of this comes down, we can, we can, it kind of comes back to what I was saying about Mahomes earlier, that in the end, it's just the player. I think if we're going to get a good sense of what the Eagles offense is going to look like early on next season, when we see Jalen Hurts for the first time, try to run with the football, Mm. go back to that new England game, that week one game guys, he just didn't look like he could run in the way that this offense needed him to run. 
I think that's a big factor in why it struggled so much and why it was so good in 2022. It wasn't just that Shane Steichen is a terrific play caller and designer and, and knew what to call and when to call it and got the offense into a rhythm. It's that part of getting that offense into a rhythm was that Hertz allowed you to get yep. easy first downs running the ball. Defenses didn't know what he was going to do, and he was so dangerous as a runner, and he values that himself as a part of his game. Well, it wasn't quite there last year. Everybody could see it. And if he can't bring that dimension to the offense, then the challenge for him and Kellen Moore becomes that much harder. You know, Mike, that's interesting you say that because I, I tell Rob all the time, I, I say we noticed it first week that he wasn't running the same, man. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Was it capability? Was it the fact that they didn't make those opportunities um, as, as available to him as they did in 2022? Uh, is the coaching staffs, the front office trying to shift the way he approaches the game? I think that's the biggest concern everyone has, right? Especially when you hear that the rumor that Cliff Kingsbury almost had the job, but obviously things fell through and Cliff Kingsbury works with mobile guys all the time. Um, many people say, Cliff, if you want Jalen Hurts to lean more into his strengths, you bring in King Kingsbury. You want Jalen Hurts to evolve a little bit more, you bring in Kellen Moore. Um, what's, your, what's your thoughts on exactly – um, that this organization wants from Jalen Hurts in terms of the direction of his development? That's a really interesting question, Tone, on a couple different levels. Um, I think they want him to develop as a passer, obviously. And I think the template for the quarterback they would like him to become is Donovan McNabb in the second half of the 2003 season and the entirety of the 2004 season. I do this often. I go on YouTube and I go back and I watch – uh, games that McNabb played early in his Eagles career and that in that sweet spot of his career, right in the second half of 03 and throughout 04, particularly in 04 when he had T.O. and Brian Westbrook at the peak of his powers. Um, and you can see him develop as a passer in the pocket. You can see that he doesn't have to run the ball as much. And Donovan always bristled at the idea that he should run a lot, right? He, he took it to heart as an individual and as a black quarterback that don't mm. stereotype me as just a guy who runs a lot. I can beat you for, with my arm. I can beat you from the pocket. It mattered a lot to him to be known as a guy who could just drop back and throw the ball and win games and be productive. Jalen doesn't quite look at it that way. Jalen sees himself as a multidimensional threat. And as somebody who considers running to be a big part of who he is as a quarterback, he has always said that. Don't leave that out of my game. And so my curiosity, and Jalen will never talk about this in any depth, is what does he think about how his career might have to evolve? Does he mm. recognize that he's got to be able week after week to beat teams just dropping back and throwing the ball? Because I think he would like to be that multidimensional guy that he was in 2022 but, you know, you get a bone bruise on your knee this season and it looks like you can't move as well. And maybe there's something else going on that we don't know about. It's a really interesting question to me, Tone, on multiple levels. And to me, it's the most curious. It's the thing I'm most curious about heading into next season. I want to see what Jalen Hurts looks like as a player this far into his career. Really quick, yeah. Rob, if I can follow up. I'm sorry, yeah, Rob, if I can yep. follow up. You know, I look at 2024 as such a crucial season because, you know, in many ways, some people look at Jalen Hurts' career with the Eagles, especially as a starter, as being a tale of three seasons or three cities, rather. Typically, it's two, but I'm, I'm going to push it to three. Um, people say he looks so much different from 21 to 22 and so, so much different from 22 to 23 in terms of uh, his goal on offense, what they were trying to accomplish, the identity. Um, I guess when you think about it from that perspective, I mean, how, how crucial is it for him? to prove that he is the franchise guy in 2024. Again, he didn't have a terrible season last year, but when you have 19 turnovers, you can't say you had a good one either. It's very crucial for him. It's very crucial for the Eagles because they've already signed him for five years and upwards of $255 million. They need him to play like that kind of quarterback, the kind of quarterback who justifies that contract. And again, we can overstate how poorly he played last season to a certain degree, but you can't take away the 19 takeaways, you know, that other teams got from Jalen Hurts. Right. And I think your point about him being a different quarterback in each of those seasons is, is very astute tone. Like he ran more in 2021 and we had questions about his arm strength. 
Then in 2022, he was much better throwing the ball than he had been the previous season. And he still had the dimension of running the ball. Then last season, he wasn't running, running as well. And he wasn't quite throwing it as well as he had in 2022 most of the time either. So uh, this is going to be really, really fascinating to see what iteration of Jalen Hurts the Eagles get next season. Yeah, and Mike, I, I, um, I certainly don't want him being foolish and reckless. And I don't think that's him, period. But I also don't want to see him think he's got to just stand in that pot. And I hope they – I, I fear part of it was the Eagles saying, hey, man, you got to be careful. And you and you keep drilling that into somebody's head. You know, I mean, it's going to affect you he, subconsciously out there. He, he, There has to be times where he picks and chooses his spots to use those legs too. Uh, it's, it is. It, it, it is really interesting to see what, what happens, uh, you know, with this thing. Kelsey, give me your gut. You were out there last week. I didn't see you at the card table with him and Bert Keshner and all the other guy, Tom Segura. I didn't get the invite to his party I know. either. I'm still mad know? at him for that. It's like, you know. but, Taylor, um, has got to call me too. I, you know, I just, I, uh, I haven't heard from her in a while. Let's and, go, Tay. You know. Yeah. Come, come um, on, Mike. Well, all that book money, you could have got to that table. <laughs> <laughs> you are operating under a misconception about the publishing industry there, Tone. Um, no, gut feeling says, I, I think he's still going to retire. I think, mm. and I don't have any inside information on this. This is total tea leaf reading on my part. Mm -hmm. um, and I could very well turn out to be wrong. But, but I get the sense, first of all, he did an interview during the week. And I forget which podcast it was on. I know he was on Shaq this week. He was on Shaq. Yeah, too. but it was he during was also Super on Chris Long. Uh, uh, I was there when he did the Chris Long yeah, podcast. Okay, okay. It, it might have been that. It might have been um, another one where he referred to the Eagles as they. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. seven times mm -hmm. in a two minute span. And I do think there's, again, just gut instinct. What he's done since the Eagles lost strikes me as a guy who is trying to wring every last drop of enjoyment he can mm -hmm. out of the experience of being an NFL player and right. having his brother mm -hmm. be in the Super Bowl and be a focal point of the national conversation and he's just along for the ride and he's going to enjoy this. So he's going to hang out with Bill's fans in Orchard Park and he's going to go to the Super Bowl. And this is a life that he's not going to be able to live after he retires. Mm. And so I'm going to live it now. That's just how it strikes me. I could mm. be completely wrong about that, uh, but that's kind of how I'm reading it. Okay. okay. That's, that, that's interesting, Mike. I, yeah. I did not think about it from that perspective. Um, but again, you know, I, I guess in my mind, I look at it like this, you know, you're coming. It's yes, he's always banged up. Right. But he's a tough guy. He's an Iron Man, doesn't miss games. Also, on top of that, you're coming off of a first team all pro season. You know, you're still playing at the top of your game. You know, granted, I mean, an 80 percent Jason Kelsey is better than 100 percent of most of these guys in the league. You know, it's I understand they're going through a, a, a bit of a little a bit of a rebuild right now. But when you're playing at that high of a level and you're that productive. It's kind of hard to walk away from that, isn't it? I would think. I think as important as that is to him, Tone, and as much as that might be on his mind, the other thing, too, is playing in the NFL is a lot of things. Yes. One thing it is is very routine-oriented. It is wake up, today is film day. Mm. You know, wake up, tomorrow it is – in the weight room from nine to 10 30 and then i'm in meetings and then we're at practice and when you've done that for as long as kelsey has done it and you don't know anything else i mean he knows other things he's a smart guy he can do other things he's going to be i would bet you know better adjusted to make the jump from playing to retirement than most pro football players are mm. but that's still a hard thing to walk away from, from this life that you have known for the last 14 years. And, and not only does it, is it that you're walking away from the thrill and the juice of playing every day, but he's also been able to enjoy the life he has away from football, being married to Kylie and their three daughters. That's the thing about the NFL. I mean, it punishes you on the field in a lot of very severe ways, Mm -hmm. But of all four of the major pro sports, it is the one that allows for the most normal, quote unquote, family life of these guys. He can see his wife and daughters every day. Mm -hmm. And so he's got everything as he wants it right now. Does he want to give up a third of that, a half of that, whatever percentage he allots to playing for the Eagles? 
and find something else to fill that void. Mm. That can be probably, I imagine that's a scary thing for any pro football player. Um, the prospect of making that decision. Uh, Mike, I want to, I want to jump around a little, I'll hit you with flyers. Uh, lost last night in overtime to the Leafs, but 29, 19 and seven, they had won four straight. They have some difficult decisions here because the trade deadline's coming up and the team's played probably if they're being truthful, much better than they anticipated. Right. So some of these guys like, like Scott Lawton, who, who gets, who gets moved. It, it, you could take a couple steps back this year if you do it. Um, what do you think about it? It's a good predicament to be in, but it's a little bit of a predicament. Oh, I think it's a big predicament. Rob. Yeah. I do. Uh, to me, this kind of uh, sets in opposition, the two forces that have been in conflict for the flyers for years and years and yeah. years. It is, do we keep trying to win or do we build for the future? Mm. Right. And look, <laughs> They're playing better than I think even they themselves mm -hmm. anticipated. I think if you shot John Tortorella and Danny Briere and Keith Jones up with sodium pentothal and asked them, did you think you'd be 29, 19, and 7 at this point? They all would say, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. But they are. And I think it does change their approach at the deadline. You know, for a couple of weeks, I've been asking people, hey, you know, if you're the Flyers, would you think about trading Travis Konechny, who is 26 and in the prime of his career? Great season, by the way. But – is having an incredible season. And do yeah. you want to give up on him or, or is the value of what you could get back for him so great that you have to make the move, move for what you could be down the road? Mm. I don't think they're going to move him. I think it's a non-starter now. I think they look at him as a centerpiece player, kind of like a uh, Brad Marchand or Patrice Bergeron kind of guy mm -hmm. for the Boston Bruins. Um, but that's the sort of thinking that's taken place now because they're outperforming expectations. I will say this, though, Rob. It hasn't been all sunshine and roses. They still had to trade away their number one prospect and Cutter Gauthier because he didn't want to play here. And their presumptive franchise goaltender, Carter Hart, is probably never going to play for them again yep. because mm -hmm. of the sexual assault charges he's facing and whatever discipline the NHL might levy against him down the road. So they've got some steps to take here. And mm -hmm. I'm in a weird way. I'm not sure them playing as well as they have made it easier for them to figure out how to take those steps. Yeah. You know, Mike, last one for me. Um, it's funny. You think about the way this Flyers team is playing and how much aggression and how fast they play and how they had, they show no fear against even the top tier guys in their conference or even in, in, in the entire league, you know, that, that, that comes from, you know, Tortorella's, you know, approach, right. Um, he's been here for a short amount of time, but it seems like he's made such a strong impression on not just the roster, but also on the franchise. Um, by your estimation, you know, you, you know, just speak on his impact and how he's slowly just altering the culture of this roster and, and, and his organization. Yeah, he's made a big difference. You know, I think a lot of people were skeptical tone about whether he was the right kind of coach for the rebuild that the Flyers were undertaking, but it seems like he has. Uh, tapped into something with certain guys. You see a guy like Morgan Frost, for instance, who was getting benched earlier in the season. Uh, you're seeing a, a greater flourishing of his game uh, lately, uh, becoming closer to the player the Flyers always thought he could be. The thing with Tortorella that's interesting to me is that I've seen this before from him, okay? In 2004, when the Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup and he was their head coach, they played the Flyers in the conference finals that year. I'm sure Rob remembers yeah. it well. Uh, se a great seven-game series. Incredible. Yeah, and that Danny lightning team, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that and that lightning team was loaded with talent. Vincent LeCavier, Brad Richards, Martin, Martin Saint, Louis. Saint, Saint Louis, guys up and down the lineup who could score, yeah. but they were winning games two to one and three to two. Tortorella had them playing this way, you know, really tight defensively, close checking, you know, scoring because they were talented. Uh, and I covered Tortorella in New York in 2000, 2012 with the Rangers when they played a very defensive minded, tough shot blocking kind of style. And they just kind of ran out of gas in the conference finals. He asked so much of them that they ended up losing to the devils because they really didn't have any more to give. Mm -hmm. That would be my concern with the flyers this season. You know, I saw somebody make a comparison between this flyers team and the Vegas golden Knights that went to the Stanley cup finals in their very first year of existence when they lost to the capitals and that Vegas team didn't have a real star at the time, but they just came after teams. Like you said, Tone, night after night after night. I think the concern, if you're a Flyers fan, 
is can this team keep that up mm. this season yes. without just grinding themselves in a dust? You know, the Tampa team in 04 could do it because it was so skilled. That Vegas team did it about as long as you could expect a team to do it. I think we have to see whether this Flyers team has that kind of staying power. All right, last one, Mike. Uh, you had a great story today uh, about Beaver Stadium um, and, and what ends up happening there. Uh, there. There's a push to have it renamed Joe Paterno Stadium. Um, and, you know, we, we know how, how – how interesting Penn State fans can be. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it that way. Um, how likely is this? And and just for people who haven't had a chance to check it out, A, you should, and B, what is your stance on this? Sure. Well, I'm going to tweak just one thing you said there, Rob. They want to name the football field at Beaver Stadium. They don't want to rename Beaver Stadium. Okay. Mm. They want to make it something like Joe Paterno Field at Beaver Stadium. I got you. Yep, fair. Which yeah. I think is a terrible idea. Yeah. Terrible idea. There's no push for this beyond a few members of Penn State's Board of Trustees, it, it, it to me it would be a slap in the face to the victims of Jerry Sandusky. Um, th this needs to, people need to be mindful and remember what happened at Penn State, but they nobody needs to dredge this back up into everybody's face in the way this proposal suggests that it would. Joe Paterno was a great football coach and a very flawed man, as it turned out. And it's okay to remember him that way. And the idea of renaming the field at Beaver Stadium after him to try to wash over his legacy or his name for the role that he played in what happened at Penn State and the, and the silence that allowed Jerry Sandusky to have free reign um, and create such terror for so long and commit such atrocities for so long. I think this is an awful idea, and I hope Penn State doesn't follow through. You see it as a slippery slope, right? I mean, I just see it as as unseemly and wrong tone. Mm -hmm. Like these were these were kids we're talking about here who were right. damaged in unspeakable ways. Who are still and, damaged as adults from it. Exactly. Right, and right. you're right, Rob. Like interesting is an interesting word to use for some of these quote unquote Penn State conspiracy mm -hmm. theorists. Um, and I, I don't have any time for them, and I don't have any time for this idea. Yep. Mm. Well said. Well said. Mike, all right, keep up the great work. Uh, we'll catch you Thank tomorrow. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate you, man. Uh, in Truly. fact, uh, at, at 10 a.m. with Glenn Macnow on WIP. And, of course, what's the next column we have coming out, Mike? We, we should. I actually – so I'm working on it now, Rob. I spoke to um, Charles Ramsey, the former Philadelphia police commissioner, yeah. about um, the shooting at the parade in Kansas City, the Chiefs mm. Victory Parade. Uh, Ramsey was in charge of the Philadelphia police in 2008 when we had the World Series parade for the Phillies. Uh, and I talked to him about what went into preparing to protect people during that parade, what's changed in the 16 years since, and whether something like what happened in Kansas City could potentially happen in Philadelphia. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Deep stuff, man. Mike, keep up the Definitely. good work. We always appreciate you. Mike, thank you so minutes. much, man. I truly appreciate your time. Anytime, guys. Thanks right. so much. Take care, Mike. All right, let's uh, let's step aside real quick here, Tom. We'll we'll kind of soak in a lot of things we, we went through Definitely. with uh, with Mike, and uh, we have a little Eagles news, which we'll pass along as well when we come back, okay. and then we'll dig into their ability to bounce back after a tough season, and we'll see if that that yeah that pattern can continue here with the 2024 Eagles. He's Tony Shields. I'm Rob Ellis. We are Sports Take. I would talk about Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group because knowing who to trust with your finances can be a real challenge. Um, and I'm right there at the front of the line with you. It took me a long time to find that right person. Well, I did. And it's Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group, whether it's retirement planning, 401k review, insurance review. If you have a small business, you're trying to get your employee benefits off the ground. That's another resource that Jim can help you with. I'll tell you on top of that, if there's just things you're not sure about, you know, something looks a little strange to you about what uh, you're invested in or you're seeing this, hey, what do you think about that? He is a great, great resource to bounce things off of. I've entrusted my IRA, my 401k rollovers with Jim, and I couldn't be any happier. You will be as well. Give him a call, 610-996-4751, 610-996-4751, or you can email him as well, murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y dot Jim at principal.com. That's murray dot Jim at principal.com.
any professional sports coach will tell you, there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Go passionately. Go fearlessly. Go confidently. Go birds! <clears throat> Go confidently towards your goals with First Trust, Philly's hometown bank for nearly 90 years, and the official bank of the Philadelphia Eagles. We're focused on getting you over the goal line. So go with conviction. Go with trust. Go Bird! And go forward with us by your side. First Trust Bank, the official bank of Philadelphia dreams. Oh, and go Birds. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their fantasy pick 'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game, and the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Sports take on this Friday. Welcome back. Tony Shields, Rob Ellis, just wrap things up with Mike Sealski. Uh, all right, Tone. So the Eagles announced uh, they have uh, given Michael Clay, special teams coordinator, a contract extension, which is uh, well deserved. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we were, all, it's crazy how life just comes full circle, right? 100%, man. We, we, like we would have been. If this were a year ago or, or whatever, losing our minds, we did. I remember we went crazy about it, but he, he yeah. absolutely, he was, his unit was the most stable and it's not even close. Uh, you had a phenomenal kicker. You had uh, a guy who turned out to be a really good punter who stepped in and did a nice job in Braden, man, mm -hmm. a Braden good Covey returner. Yeah. With Covey. And you know, they, oh. off the top of my head, not a lot of big returns given up. So, I mean, it was, every box was checked there, man. From, you from know, like, who was like, a great special teamer. Um, Sydney Brown and Keely Ringo. Yes, those guys. Those guys got down the field quick, and when they got hands on you, you you really didn't go anywhere. Um, I agree. So look, man, Michael Clay, job well done. Let's yep. try to keep it up, man. Let's try to keep it up. Yeah. So that's uh, that's good. And I, I, you, you like to see a guy get rewarded who uh, who deserves. It. His group would have been good in 2022 <laughs> because I think if they were, I mean, obviously a lot of things happened in that game, but if if Kadarius Tony doesn't return that punt, <laughs> well, anyway. right, there's no doubt. And, and part, of, honestly, part of me, um, part of me looks at it like, was that guy given enough to be able to, you know, do a good job at that time? Know? Right? Yeah. yeah, we talked about it. We talked yeah. about it for sure. Um, also, uh, from Adam Schefter of ESPN, Jimmy Garoppolo uh, will be suspended two games for violating the NFL's performance enhancing substance. Uh, policy related to a prescribed medication without having a valid therapeutic use exemption. Okay. <laughs> without having a valid therapy. Did they, Sounds like are, he was taking are we talking stuff. about weed? That's what it sounds like. No, I, I don't, no, I don't think they consider weed a performance enhancer. They don't test for weed anymore. They don't test for weed. It, it's not weed. Okay. It's some kind of. I thought they did, but the, but the ramifications were sort of lower. No, I don't think they do even. Okay, honestly, okay. I don't. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it sounds like he took something that, you, you know, I mean, we've been through this before. Like you have to, you got to make sure you get the approval. Here's the oh, thing. I, I know some of this gets, exemption. some of this gets sketchy, but there is a way for them, them being the players, they have a 1-800 number that they can call and they can say, Hey, uh, what about X? Am I, is X good? 
His ex on the ban list. I don't know. Who knows, right? Uh, a- anabolic uh, blocker is what Sill says it is. Okay, mm, that's so, the kind of stuff, that's that's the kind of stuff that keeps you from getting uh, jittery and keeps you from getting uh, you know, um, it kind of relieves your it, it relieves your stress to a point where you don't get rattled. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So, and I, I don't. I don't even know. I mean, the future for him is as a backup and he's made a good amount of money. I don't know how many more years we're going to see, you know, Jimmy G here, uh, even in the NFL, but nonetheless. Um, so two things to keep in mind there. All right. Um, and by the way, uh, the Eagles special teams first in punt uh, return yards. Uh, first in DVOA. So they were, you know, by all the metrics as well. Um, very good. Um, as special teams unit. Yeah, yeah, and all and all the analytics nerds love DVOA. They you see a and, lot of DVOA. It's like war in baseball. You see a lot of DVOA right. these days. Right. Hey, I, I didn't know they were number one in DVOA. Yep. Wow. They were yeah. that good. Pretty it's, pretty it's, impressive. It's probably, it's probably hard to notice when everybody else sucked. So yeah. Uh, real quick, just last thing on the on the um, Jimmy G suspension. It sounds like kind of a throwaway, but according to Field Yates of ESPN, being suspended has massive financial implications for Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, it, it could void his $11.25 million in base salary from the Raiders that he's owed, regardless of whether the team keeps him on the roster or not. So this, this, could, this could free the Raiders. That's huge for the Raiders. Yo, if I'm the Raiders, thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Want any more, Jimmy? No. Um, <laughs> can I get you another serving? <laughs> Yo, yeah. You want any more, Jimmy? Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, I got that's I know a like guy. A from- <laughs> yeah, I know a guy. Uh, we can make this happen. Oh, my God. That sounds like a line from a Jim, uh, Jack Nicholson movie. Yeah. All right. Sounds insane. <laughs> um, all right. So we, we were talking about this and just – you know, the, the season that the Eagles had. So like, just to put it in perspective, they were 11 and six and they did make the playoffs. So when when we do this comp, understand that the other bad years were a lot worse than this. But we know how it ended, which was horrendous. So, all right, we're looking at bounce backs with Howie Roseman as the general manager and, mm-hmm. and being here. So you go back to Andy Reid's last year, OK, which was uh, which was 2012. And the Eagles are four and twelve that season. Andy Reid gets fired. Uh, they move on, and they hire Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly comes in in twenty thirteen. They win the division and they finish ten and six on the season. So you know a, a six game swing uh, in twenty thirteen. Now we know as time went on, everybody kind of figured out Chip, and there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes with Chip, whatever. But the first year that Chip came in. The team bounced back. All right. So obviously they upgraded some personnel. They did some different things that got them there. Then you go to 2015 when things had run its course with Chip. You remember he got bounced before the last game, but the team ends up finishing seven and nine out of the playoffs. Doug Peterson gets hired. Now the first year is kind of a lateral step. They stay seven and nine, Mm -hmm. but the second season they go 13 and three and they win the Super Bowl. So again, Mm -hmm. quick turnaround, right? Then you go to 2020, which is Doug's last year. They're four eleven and one. Bad, really, kind of a you know just spin out. Everything's bad with Wentz. You, you know, a, a lot of things went wrong. So Nick comes in the following year, Nick Sirianni, and they go nine and eight. They finish in second in the NFC East, and they make the postseason off of that. The next year, they're fourteen and three and get to the Super Bowl. So the last three examples that we have of a, a either a, a coaching ch- and these all coincided with coaching changes. So there is a little bit of a distinction there, but with bad years they've generally gotten it back either the following year or pretty quickly in, in the case of uh, Doug, where the second season they won a Super Bowl. Does that give you any yeah. kind of solace that, they, you know, that these patterns can continue? I mean, you know, I try, I, I try, to, look, I try to look at every season as being independent of the last, um, but trends matter. And, and even then, it's so it's hard to establish a trend when you're dealing with three or four different head coaches from different eras, right? Different times with the team. You know what? You know what? As I look at this, right, the, the most significant difference between 22 and 23, in my opinion, was just how the defense just fell off a cliff in 2023. I mean, you went from being ranked eighth in the league in terms of points given up to 30th. Mm-hmm. You went from being second in terms of yards given up. 26. So when you think about it from that perspective, 
that 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 can't be the case. If we're going to have any sort of resurgence, any sort of bounce back season, it has to start on the defensive side of the ball. They have to at least get themselves to a position where they're mediocre, where they're serviceable, where they're at the very least competent. Can they go from being ranked 30th in points given up to 15th in points given up? That's the goal, in my humble opinion, for the 2024 season. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. So let, let's – because we, we've talked a lot about Hurts, and we actually will in the next segment as well, but let's focus on the defense. You, you're right. 25 points per game, 30th. 252.7 passing yards per game, 31st. Mm. Third down efficiency, 30th. 43 sacks, 20th. Last in takeaways at 18. I mean, so you're 30th in points, 31st against the pass, 30th in, in third down, and dead last in turnovers. So th- there's major, major fixes. I know how he said you, you, the- you can't win with that. No, you just can't. And I, and I know how he said that the cupboard isn't bare. And I think when he says that, well, I think it applies to the offense. I'll buy okay. it on the offensive yeah, side. Yeah, I'll buy it on that side. I'm not buying it on the defensive side. You, you can make a case, Tone, that you you should, if, if there wasn't a salary cap, and you could just, it's back in the day, and you could cut guys and whatever. I'd blow out both linebackers. I'd blow out both corners. And I, and I wouldn't have, I'd put Bradbury, uh, a blank and ship as a special teamer. I would have a new secondary completely and I have new linebackers completely. Let's stay there for a second. I'm glad you said that. That begs the question, who on this defense to you is untouchable? Jalen Carter. I don't think anybody else is untouchable. Wow. Wow. I like Josh Sweat. but I like Josh, Josh Sweat, too. You know, his numbers went down last year. There's no denying that. Um, I like Hassan Reddick, but his future is very much – I don't know, up in the air here. I don't know about Jordan Davis. I don't know about N'Kobe Dean. Mm-hmm. I, everybody else is a question mark. Every, wow, every, one every, guy. Everybody, think about it. I really like Sidney Brown. I don't know. I got to right. see him a whole year. I got to see how he responds from his knee. I don't know what that looks like. So I, I don't, there's nobody I'm like in love with. I, I like Jalen Carter, but I, that's it. Wow. One guy out of 11 stars. Who would you, I mean, would you? No, no, no. I'm with you. Yeah. Let me make that clear. I'm pretty much with you. Um, there are sure there are other players I like, yeah, or I'm interested in. Yeah, but untouchable is the word, right? Yeah. There's only one guy on this defense that's untouchable to me. And you said his name, Jalen Carter. And that is damning for Harry yep. Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. They have to find a way to reload this roster defensively, not just from a starting perspective, from a depth perspective, because injuries mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. And I just look at it, it's not that some of these guys you can't say were misses yet. Jordan Davis isn't a miss. Jordan Davis is a prove it to me this year. Well, he better hurry up before it turns into a miss because he's pretty he, he's he's close. He's entering year three of of his kind of his rookie deal. Yeah. And I think year three is going to decide for them if they pick up the fifth year option. Right. And if they don't pick up the fifth year option, that's telling us right then and there how they see him. I agree with you. Now, um, Nicobe Dean, this is a an absolute prove it year for him. Absolutely, they, he doesn't have a fifth year option. If he doesn't figure out in year three and goes in a year four with the lame duck contract, again, it tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, and I just want to see a couple other guys step like Nolan Smith is a prove it guy. Uh, mm-hmm. He's going into his second year, so there the jury's out. It doesn't mean that these guys should be gone or whatever. The, the the talk or the 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 process that you have to go through here is yes you're going to give those guys opportunities but how are you turning over some other parts of this roster mm. what are you doing to upgrade linebacker what are you doing to upgrade safety what do you you know are, are, are you really counting that much on Isaiah Rogers like how how much weight are you putting into certain guys is also a big part of this thing for me like they better be right in their evaluation if they think certain guys can play. That's the big part of this thing. Absolutely. And so far, based off what we heard, Harry Roseman is putting a lot of stock into N'Kobe Dean. And the fact of the matter is, no matter how much we like N'Kobe Dean, he's an undersized linebacker who couldn't stay on the field. You know, let's just really think about the injury history thus far. 
March 9th, he sustained a chest pectoral pull grade one. And I think he also suffered from, suffered from a foot injury that happened in training camp that had him out for the remainder of the uh, preseason. Then week one, he deals with something called pedal foot. Then, and that was on September 10th. Right. He yeah, goes against on the I- Patriots. He, played, he right. started that game and then got hurt. Yep. Right. Then he goes on IR. And he comes off of IR, and he suffers another injury on November 5th. Pedal, Liz Frank sprain. He goes on IVR again. Right. So, and that, and at that point, he required surgery. Right. I, th- I think it was the same foot. So, when you think about it from that perspective, the right foot at that, when you think about it from that perspective, uh, how can Harry Oseman sit there and say to the general public, oh, yeah, we believe in Nicobe Dean? What has he shown you to prove that? I just, I just really hope that there's a better plan B in place than what they had last year because it, it, it became scramble mode. It became let's bring Moro back after we cut him. It became let's again Zach Cunningham was fine. I don't, I don't want to dump on Zach Cunningham. He was fine. He was okay. And if he comes back, it's fine. But the, he can't he be my best linebacker though. <clears throat> no, but you were also fortunate that he wasn't playing for anybody at the time, so you were able to pick him up. And good on the Eagles for doing it, but still, what what I just you you can't you've he's shown you. This may end up being a situation where we're going to look back and we say, "Hey, it was just fluky." Uh, Nakobe Dean got hurt that that rookie his second for whatever second year's first year as a starter, and it was just one of those things. I, I don't know. I, I I'm leery of a guy who's undersized, right? Who who's had some of those issues before, so I just can't go there. Um, you know, I I need more of a plan in place, more, more resources and money allotted to that position, whether that's the draft, whether that's free agency, whether you make a minor trade, I don't know, but there's gotta be more there and you have to come out of your comfort zone and and pay that position a little bit more than you, you generally pay it. Let me ask you this question on a scale of one to 10, 10 being obviously the, the most and one being the least, how aggressive do you believe, Harry Roseman needs to be this off season. Do you think he needs to be a 10 level of aggressive? Um, where do you fall in that, in that regard? How aggressive does Harry Roseman need to be? Part of his aggression is dictated a little bit by the salary cap. But if you're asking me, I think he needs to be in the, at least the eight range. Well, I mean, think about it, Tone. I mean, we're talking about seven, potentially seven new starters on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. That's that's like if Reddick gets traded or whatever, but I mean it may not be that many. So that's a lot but of people. That's a lot of people. So yeah, I plus mean, a new plus a new coaching staff. Right, right, and that's we talked about this yesterday. Like when you have this amount of turnover, generally, it, you know, can you can you wheel that thing back in that quickly? I don't know. I mean, I think I, I like I said before, the offense to me is a way easier fix. I think you just have to like kind of get the train back on the track and and you can nudge it and do some things that, that I think you're going to be all right. I think Fangio's really got to get to the core of this thing. It, my hope is they they wouldn't bring in a guy that experienced um who who doesn't strike me as a as an ass kisser. Mm. If they weren't going to listen to him a little bit. You know, I don't know that he's kowtowing at this point in his life. So I think he is going to lay it out straight. Yeah, and also, I really don't. and also at this point, again, he's an older man. You know, the older you get, the more crabby you get. So the last thing you want, the last thing he wants to go to a situation where someone's trying to tell him how to do his job, right? Yeah. And uh, it makes you think, what were those conversations like between Vic Fangio and Harry Roseman when it comes to Hassan Reddick? You know, how how much does Vic Fangio want Hassan Reddick to be here still? Um, had, does he have any influence in Good those? Point. You know, and 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 whether or not the Eagles. Um, make an aggressive push to get Hassan Reddick back on the, you know, but he's still on the roster. He's still on the contract, but, you know, to, to establish something more long-term with him to get things figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that we have to consider as well. Yeah. And, and look, I think too, you always have to take into account sometimes in sports where things start to snowball and then everything just, just, just goes to, you know, goes to hell. Right. So maybe there was a little bit of that, but I think that's an easy way of justifying in your head what went wrong. I think you got to be really straight with yourself and say, did we do enough last year on that side of the ball from a personnel standpoint? You know, I I understand there's certain things 
I get they weren't going to pay Hargrave. That's understandable. Mm-hmm. Even though he played really well, he was he was excellent in the Super Bowl too. Mm-hmm. But I guess okay, and I, and I can see them trusting Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter and Fletcher Cox and Milton Williams enough to say we'll move on there. But I don't know. I think they made a mistake trusting what they had over TJ Edwards. I think they, they got, made a mistake. They got cute, in my yeah. humble opinion. You know, to sum it all up, they got cute. They got cocky, and they felt like he was easily replaceable. Yeah. And that clearly wasn't the case. Right. And now, now, and, and if I'm being totally fair, when we heard that Bradbury was coming back, I was glad. We all were. We all so, were. You know, it's, it's, it'll be revisionist history if, if anyone said, yeah, I was totally against him coming back. No, you weren't. Yeah. We all, we all were with him coming back. Um, obviously we didn't anticipate the fall off to be something like this. We didn't think we'll see a, uh, you know, maybe he didn't, maybe we didn't expect him to play to the exact same level because right. that was his best season of his career last year. But at the same time, we didn't think he would fall off a cliff like that. That and was, that's why that was I, a cataclysmic I, fall. It was. And, and that's where I don't, I can't kill them for that one. But what you have to do now is figure out a way to move on. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be easy. But you got to figure out a way to move on from him. You can't put him out there again and allow the same things to happen. Like you can't justify it by saying maybe we'll stick him in the slot. He won't be as bad. No teams will explode, 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 exploit him, and they're going to go after him. He's going to be the mark on the defense side of the ball. (laughs) That's funny. He's going to be the mark. (laughs) He is, man. And I'm telling you, and and it's going to be a situation where you're trying to do everything else that you can to make up for it, and it's not. It doesn't work that way. You know, they're they're too good. Those guys, those, those coordinators, and those quarterbacks. To, to, to not explo- uh, exploit him and, and really try to – I don't even know. Like, Slay, I think, is going to be fine. He'll be okay. But that's not a great situation either. I, I hope Isaiah Rogers can step in there and play. Yeah, it's the thing a, about Slay – A little layup for, layoff for him. Yeah, the thing about Slay is, you know, because it, because of the nature of his contract, he's not going anywhere for, you know, for a while. So um, that kind of puts them in a bind there. But, you know, it, make, it makes you think back to all the moves they made – that off season, what did Tyree Roseman really do? That off season, okay, just generally, draft. just uh, generally, and I'm not even talking about the draft. I'm talking about just, just moves to supplement the roster, like free agency moves. Okay, you brought back, you brought back Bradbury. Okay, what was the other move he did? They restructured Slay. Restructured uh, they brought Slay. Brought back Bradbury. They signed Nicholas Morrow. They signed Zach Cunningham, Miles Jack. And he, Miles was, Jack he, was, he was, he was, he was, yeah, but Zach Cunningham was, uh, I believe. Yeah, you know, like camp. He was late. But, uh, but, but even still. then, though, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Pr- prior to week one. And so you brought in Zach Cunningham. You brought in Miles Jack, who ultimately ended up retiring. And then came back and played uh, for Pittsburgh, which was you, the whole thing was weird. Yeah. Right, right. You um, re-signed Bradbury. You restructured Slay. Yep. You bring in Nicholas Morrow, cut him, and then bring him back because you had to. In all reality... Harry Roseman had a very passive offseason. Yeah. Very passive. I agree. For a guy who, who for a guy who was saying that, you know, the, the time is now, that offseason was overtly passive. Not just passive, just bad. Just bad. I, I mean, you um do you let Edwards walk? He had a good year uh, in Chicago. You had to you had to sort of let Hargrave go, but he played well in San Francisco. Um yeah, he had a bad offseason. And when he went to the well with the older players la- the, the previous year, they, they brought in Sue and Linvale Joseph, who helped. Yeah, they brought in guys who helped you. They didn't this year. These guys didn't. didn't I mean, Cunningham helped. Don't get me wrong. And, and Morrow was eh. Um, but they didn't. None of those guys really were home runs. Byard was a mistake. He stunk. Right. He was but I, to your point, right, All, Byard didn't pan out. But I respected that swing. Yeah. I, don't, I, I respected again, that swing because they were bad at safety. And yeah. – Tara Evans was a liability in coverage. I agree. And and you you figure, okay, I trade for a former All Pro, a guy who's what thirty, um, a guy who has a lot of experience, a guy who's well respected, a proven leader. I respect that swing. I just obviously it, it didn't pan out. The Shaq Leonard thing to me felt like a pipe dream because yeah. I said to myself, you think he's going to change things? You know, knowing what we know about his injury history and all that kind of stuff. I mean, when it happened, we all were like, okay, cool. Let's let's see what happens. Again, I respect swings. I'm never going to get mad at a mad at a, a GM for taking swings um in you know in season, especially at the trade deadline, or even yeah. if you take the waiver wire. It just felt like some of some of the things he was trying to fix 
were things he probably could have handled in the off season, and he was trying to play catch up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he he look he didn't have a good off season, and this is again where he's it's incumbent upon him to rise raise his game, you know, and and get them back because oh, you want to get if, the other thing is if you want to give uh, if you're going to keep Nick, and you want to give us the cupboards not bare, okay, so you better show it to me next year. Rob, remember we were just talking about Jimmy G situation. Yeah, they cut him. So the Ra- Raiders, yeah, the Raiders are, are absolutely looking to get out of that eleven million. Hey, Smart. listen, it's always about the money. Yep. Try to tell people this. Listen, the more yep. the more I talk about sports, the more the more I'm engaged, and the more I learn about the business, and try to put my fandom to the side most yeah. days. Yeah. The more I realize, it always circles back to the money. Absolutely. It always will. It always has been. Yeah. Um. And <laughs> Jimmy G, man, he just lost. He just lost twelve million. Eleven point two five million. You lost eleven million dollars because you couldn't pick up the phone. Oh, God. Think, think about think about how life works, man. Isn't that insane? You lost eleven million because you you couldn't pick up the phone. Aren't you? No I mean, to me, when I when there is that kind of dough at stake, I'm I'm going. I'm 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 calling five different places. I'm 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 looking. I'm I'm on the I'm on the internet making sure it's okay. I'm calling my my representative, my my player rep. I'm call, I'm checking with the organization. Like I'm not I'm not I'm not drinking tap water. You know, it, it, for fear that <laughs> something like this happens. It's crazy. Man, I'm not taking any vitamins. If, if like if I don't no. listen. No Flintstones okay, chewables or even yeah, no happening. Flintstones chewables. No, uh, no. <laughs> Barney Rubble's not even getting chewed up on oh that. Oh my god! I'm G- telling you, Jimmy G, man. Yep. You know what? Just the name Jimmy G sounds like the kind of guy who makes those kind of screw ups, man. <laughs> Seriously, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, all right, let's. Uh, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the offensive side and the trust question. You know, when it comes to Jalen Hurts and it comes to Nick Sirianni, was it lost? If it was, at what moment in that season? So we'll get into all that when we return. Don't go anywhere. Tone and Rob hanging with you on a Friday. All right, let me tell you about Pro Action Restoration. Yes, Pro Action Restoration. If you have a home, you have a business, you have a property you own, and you go through the pain, the inconvenience of water, fire, smoke, mold damage, you know how trying that can be. Um, the beauty is Pro Action Restoration is on call 24 hours, seven days a week to assist. And if you've ever been through something like this, trust me, uh, you want somebody like that on your side. I went through it and they were absolutely awesome. They figured out the problem. They put all the work in to correct things, all the damage that I had done. And they worked in conjunction with my insurance company. So Pro Action Restoration is licensed, bonded, fully insured. And they've been serving the tri-state area for more than two decades. They handle anything from water, fire, smoke damage, mold remediation, and beyond. All right. They can handle it. Trust me. And they're all called 24-7 which means you can call them at night, call them on the weekend, you name it. Uh, give a call right now, 610-623-3760, 610-623-3760, or online at ProActionRestoration.com. That's ProActionRestoration.com. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, We've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Seven, seven, three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams 
deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. We're back. That's Stone. I'm Rob. Thanks for hanging on this Friday. Appreciate it. Hit the like button if you could, folks. All right. So, um, Tone, the the offensive numbers for the Eagles last year, they're okay. I mean, they're they're not. They're certainly not where the the defensive numbers were terrible. So, 25 points per game, little about, about 25 and a half, which is the seventh best in football. Certainly solid. Uh, 16th in the passing game. You know, the running game started off hot and then kind of cooled a little bit. Um, the numbers are, they're, they're okay generally. Um, but we know by watching this team, by what we saw the year before and how, how good they were, how effective they were, how much they dictated the game to the other team, how much the other team was on their toes, guessing at what they were doing and how much this year looked like the team already had the game plan figured out that they were playing a lot, right? They they kind of knew what to expect to the point where even Nick Sirianni after the season called it stale, uh, the game plan players themselves, like Lane Johnson said, you know, team study the film. They knew what we were going to be doing. So there was, there was a lot going on there. Um, so the question begs with Nick coming back, we know that Jalen's not going anywhere. First year of that $250 million deal. Um, do you think there's trust still there? Do you think there's belief uh, and I'm going to ask it from Jalen's standpoint to Nick, not Nick to Jalen. Do you think that Jalen is still a believer in Nick in your estimation? And if not, when did it go away? You know, that's a hell of a question, Rob, because, you know, I'm, I'm over here looking at, you know, some of Jalen Hurts' advanced passing stats, you know, when it comes to play type, right? You know, he really thrived in that RPO. Um, he really thrived with the RPOs in 2022. Um, in 2022, uh, he... He had 148 RPO plays called for him. In 2023, he had 116. That's a th- that's 32. That's a 32 play discrepancy, right? Okay. Through those one, and now listen to this. This is where things get really interesting. Through th- through those 148 plays that were RPOs that were called for, him, it accounted for just over 1,100 yards. Hmm. Just over 1,100 yards. That's Passing yards, that's rushing yards, but mainly most of it was passing yards. Right. Over a thousand of his RPO plays accounted for over a thousand passing yards, right? In 2023, 116 RPO plays called only accounted for 582 total yards, mm-hmm. 498 passing yards, 89 pass attempts to 122 pass attempts in, in 2022. So again, Jalen Hurts' production in the RPO significantly diminished. On top of that, the opportunities diminished as well. So when I think about it from that perspective, A, I, this is what this is what I take from it. 
they weren't giving him as many opportunities in RPO, meaning they wanted to cut it down, meaning they they, they didn't want him put they, they didn't want him put putting himself, himself at, risk. Yeah. At, at risk, right? So that's that's one. Number two, I think the I think the league caught up to what they were doing. Yes. Yes, it's not as simple as they were trying to be more conservative with him from a health perspective. It was also right. like they 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 read it. They really they knew. They, yeah, they knew they, what was going to happen. They had an off season to really dive into this thing and figure out the, what the looks were. Like, the, like yeah. again, you had over a thousand passing yards from the RPO. Yeah, that accounted for thirty three percent of Jalen Hurts' passing production in twenty twenty two. In twenty twenty three. 400 only 498 passing yards made by way of the RPO. If we're doing some math here, 498 RPO yards, 498 RPO passing yards divided by Jalen Hurts' total um, passing yards, which were uh, just over 3,800, 3,858 uh, 3, to be exact. Mm -hmm. Only only 13 percent of Jalen Hurts' passing yards came by way of the RPO. Whereas though in 2022, like I said, I gave you a rough estimate of 33%. That's insane. That's a that's north of 20. That's a that's north of 20% of a drop off in terms of his RPO production. Yeah, the league caught up, and Nick Sirianni and that uh, and that offensive staff didn't do enough when it came to um, evolving and being more creative with the RPO. So I say all that to say. I think Jalen Hurts' trust in I think Jalen Hurts' trust in Nick Sirianni has diminished. Now, has it all been lost? Maybe not, right? Because I be, I personally believe trust isn't something that's black and white. I no, think it can be gained. It, it, maybe. It, okay. Well, I'm, what do you mean then? I'm sorry. What do you mean? No, no, you're no, you're right. If I'm saying trust can be lost, trust can also be regained, right? Okay. Especially if I'm saying it's fluid. But here's the thing. Sometimes when you have when you when you see a large enough sample size of someone, you say to yourselves, oh no, they don't have the answers. They can't figure this out. Because again, this wasn't just something that just popped up on Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni. This was a progression throughout the season. Yeah. And I bet any amount of money Jalen Hurts was looking to his coach for answers. Okay, they're seeing this coming. What what do you got for me, Nick? What do you got for me, um, uh, Brian? What do you got? Over an eight-week decline, over an eight-week span, we saw this offense become a shell of itself. We saw Jalen Hurts' uh, skill set become damn near obsolete. We saw guys in the passing game unable to get open, yeah. unable to move the chain, unable to drive, however you want to slice it. So I think the, the trust between Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts, more so the trust that Jalen Hurts has in Nick Sirianni, yeah. Diminished because when you have a coach that can't give you the answers or provide any sort of counter to what defenses are doing to you guys, it's kind of hard to look beyond that and say, Yeah, I think this guy can figure it out because you had eight weeks to do it again. On top of that, four of those weeks were against lesser opponents, right? I, I, here's here's where I'm at, and, and I, you make a really good case with everything where I'm torn, torn on two fronts. How much of it was Brian Johnson? How much can we put on the fact that you just you made two mistakes with your coordinators? And I, I'm, I'm I find that one harder, to, like not quite as plausible because Nick schemed it up. Mm -hmm. It was his game plan. Remember? Yeah, he, he, he kept he, saying he that. Let's tell us that all the time, right? So that that's why I'm having a little bit more of a hard time with that. And then the other part of it is how much of it was something that Jalen maybe checked to or how much of it was, J Hey, the play was there, but he held the ball too long in the pocket. You know, Hey, he had sort of the Wentz, you know, syndrome, if you will, where you're just, mm -hmm. you're wait, you, you got to have that clock and the clock wasn't fast enough in your head. Mm -hmm. They're the, that's the, and again, I'm not giving you like the defensive Nick. I'm just saying when I try to hash all of this out with the offense, allotting the blame to me is interesting because I've heard, I had a lot of people tell me, Listen, man, the plays that were called weren't all that bad. The quarterback just needs to to, to execute them better than he did. That's that's the, the, that that's interesting, and I think that's a very good point. Um, I think Jalen Hurts does ha, does have to be better in his role, right? Yeah. And you know, again, right? The last thing I want to do is pretend Jalen Hurts is isn't culpable or anything that went wrong. Yeah. That's the last thing I want to imply. He definitely has to carry, and he turned the ball over 19, 19 times. Yeah. 
19 times this season he made bad decisions or he didn't secure the ball enough, right? Mm-hmm. Let me let me take it a step further for you, yeah. right? Yeah. This isn't just the RPO game, the play action game as well, which relies heavily on what? The running game to be successful. Yeah. In 2022, the Eagles had 133 pass attempts that were play action plays. 133 pass attempts in 2022 that were passing that, that they were passing please right mm-hmm. in 2022 their 133 play action attempts accounted for 1094 passing yards again 1094 passing yards that's about 30 to 33 percent of Jalen hurts's passing production just how the RPO was in 2023 the Philadelphia Eagles had only 81 play action pass attempts. That's a 52 play discrepancy. Mm-hmm. In 2023, those those 81 play action pass attempts only accounted for 646 passing yards. Yeesh. The Eagles were inept in their RPO game. They were inept in their play action game. What do those two categories rely heavily on? in order to be successful Mm -hmm. the running game yes people like to say the eagles upgraded at running back and i liked deandre swift throughout the season i felt like he didn't get the ball enough Mm -hmm. but based off of these numbers and how it affected the passing game the philadelphia eagles regressed as a running team it's no if ands buts about it yeah they were they were unable to get any push they were unable to sustain drives with the running game they couldn't rely on it in any way or they chose not to know, or they chose not to rely on it, which then evolved into them not being able to do it at all. Right, and and, and to just while you're on that for a minute, there there's no to me better example uh, whether this is Nick or Brian Johnson of just not getting it. The Tampa game, the playoff game, you didn't have AJ Brown number one, which is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Jalen's got the messed up finger where you remember we go through the whole pregame thing where he's got the glove on, the gloves off, it's taped up, blah blah blah. It's a, and and Tampa wasn't all that good of late against the run at that point. I mean, it was beyond belief to me that they didn't try to hammer the ball more in that, especially in that game. It just makes no sense at all. Yes, and I want to do some more math with you, uh, Robert. That's all right because I think what we're doing here is um, we're really getting deep into the nitty gritty of Jalen Hurts' production and what makes him successful. Um, so. Listen to this. In 2022, Jalen Hurts, like I said, 1,068 passing yards from the RPO. Yeah. 1,194 yards from the play action. That's 2,162 yards, right? Passing. Jalen Hurts threw for 3,700 passing yards in 2022. That was only in what – Three less games, right? Two less games. Anyway, two, yeah, I got two. You. Le- just two less games, right? Mm-hmm. Two less games. So I say all that to say, two thousand one hundred and sixty-two of his passing yards came from the RPO and the play action. Yep. If you divide that by his total passing yards, so you can get the percentage of those plays. Yeah. Fifty-eight percent of Jalen Hurts' passing production came from the RPO and play action. Hmm. Fifty-eight percent. Yeah. Now, a lot, a lot of production there. Now, 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 let's go into twenty twenty-three, right? Yeah. Six hundred and forty-six play action yards plus four hundred and ninety-eight RPO yards. That's one thousand one hundred and forty-four passing yards via the RPO and the play action. You divide that by his total passing yards in twenty twenty-three, which was three thousand eight hundred and fifty-eight yards. That accounts. For only 29% of Jalen Hurts' passion production. So when it comes to the RPO and the play action, even and on top of that, he had more pass attempts in 2023. He had about 70 or 75 more pass attempts. So again, his RPO and play his RPO and play action production went from accounting for 58% of his total production to 29% of his total production. The Philadelphia Eagles had no running game in 2023. And we need to be honest about that. Based off of Jalen Hurts' passing numbers, and he's a quarterback that relies on the RPO, that relies on the play action, right? He's a dual threat guy. Yeah. He didn't run as he he didn't run for as many attempts. He didn't run for as many yards. Um, 
Um, uh, DeAndre Swift didn't have the running yards that Miles Sanders had last year. The entire Eagles running game from last year to this year is night and day. His production plummeted in the passing game because the Eagles could not get the running game going because they rely on the RPO, because they rely on the play action. Yeah, they I, have I to mean, do a better it, job of putting him in position to be successful. So, do you know the last last game that DeAndre Swift ran for a hundred yards was in the season? Week three, week four, week three against Tampa Bay. He rushed for 175 against Minnesota week two, 130 the next week, and didn't get over 100 after that. He got 92 against the Giants in that game uh, on Christmas, right? But, you know, not good. Not We're good. Not, but here, here's the sad part about it. When you saw that you were able to get that running game going with Swift and, and uh, you know, with Swift, you know, in weeks two, week three, or whatever, when you saw that, you should have said, oh, okay, we got to feed him more. Yeah. It's going. It's going to provide balance. The Eagles' offense wasn't nowhere near as balanced as they were in 2022. Yeah, their RPO game wasn't as productive. People caught up with it. They need to be more creative with that. Their play action game suffered tremendously because they couldn't run the ball. Teams weren't biting on your play action. Teams didn't think you could do it. Also, the attempts in general went down. So they got away from because the numbers indicate they got away from the play action and got away from the RPO. That also implies they got away from the running game. Yeah. This Philadelphia Eagles team needs to establish who they want to be. And mm -hmm. they need to lean in hard into who they are, especially on offense. This yeah. team thrives in a play action. They thrive in the RPO. Your quarterback thrives in those scenarios. How creative can Kellen Moore be when it comes to putting Jalen Hurts in the positions for him to be successful? How much can Jalen Hurts develop as a quarterback so maybe he doesn't have to rely so heavily on the RPO to be successful? But then again, yeah. we ask ourselves, what is the most optimal version of Jalen Hurts? And I feel like we're still figuring that out. I think so, too. And, and I think in fairness, um, you know, with him, I don't know how much went on. Even You're never going to see it because he's a great poker player. But, you know, with some of the stuff that, that maybe Joe San Liquido wrote about, how many, how many, how much of a. Distraction is probably the wrong word, but like the, the the changes when you sign that big contract, what that does for you, what that does to you that first year, the, the time constraints that you had where you couldn't work on your game maybe as much. I think all of those things are are, are something that, that Jalen has to figure out and, and realize, all right, that didn't work for me last year. This worked for me. I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, we all know that he could probably be a little bit more vocal. I don't think he gets out. Of, I don't want him to be out of character for who he is, but could be right. a little bit more vocal and, and hey, let's just grab a bite to eat, guys. Yeah, he could do that kind of stuff better. Yeah. And I think maybe all of those little things add up to a big thing. But you're right. More than anything else, they have got to figure out how to play to his strengths, do what works best for him, while also making sure that he improves on some things that any NFL quarterback is going to have to do. You know, that just basic stuff. You got to get the ball out quicker. Take what's given you. But I, I also think, too, this is just my theory, that I mean, I, I, I say it because of when Brian Johnson was asked the question point blank, what needs to happen with this offense? we got to get more chunk plays. I know every NFL team wants chunk plays, but last year was an issue with them throwing the ball deep too much and not yeah. taking what was given. So yeah, I think they got to get Yeah, their downfield the game wasn't nowhere near as productive. You're right. Yeah, and just get – hey, man, look, let's make your life easier. You don't have to make the low percentage, you know, deep shot throw. Take hey, Dallas Goddard standing there in the flat. Zip. Get Let it him out. make a play. He gets he gets, gets paid millions of dollars for them to make them plays. Let him make a play. Trust yeah. tr trust the trust the guys in the flat, you know, trust well, the shallow crossers. Yeah, and the other thing that the, the, the Seattle game, we, we all go back to that game because that's when they said they ad libbed. I get that that players are going to audible that that sometimes you're going to do things a little bit uh, you know, out of the norm and all that. But that was also a way of saying like they're not really believing in what's coming in, you know, from the sideline. And that remember, that that told you loud and clear that that was the case. Yep, and I and I think earlier in this segment you asked me when did it happen? When yeah. did the when when did the mutiny occur? Yeah. And obviously mutiny is maybe a bit of over exaggeration, but the the break, um, the, the, the if you yeah. will, the yeah, right. whatever it was. What right, what yeah, when did the disconnect happen? I think the Seattle game is a legitimate benchmark. Mhm. Mm um, or or was it as simple as you know the San Fran beat down and everybody 
it cast a doubt in everybody's head on both sides of the ball. And then all, good- everything changed there. Right. Because you're still winning up until that point. I'll, I'll say the Cowboys game, the second one. Yeah, the, because, the game at Dallas. Because yeah. remember, um, prior to that, nine, oh, no, after that Niners game, Bosa was like, oh, yeah, we figured them out. We, 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 we put out the blueprint. You know, it's, it's game over for them now. Right. Mm-hmm. And from that point forward, I feel like as a head coach, when they came out and the confidence Bosa spoke with, and I'm not saying Nick Sirianni is listening to Nick, a Nick Bosa press conference, but when that when you felt like they figured you out and you couldn't do anything about it, that should have been your cue to go to the drum board or whoever heard it in the building. I'm sure mm-hmm. somebody heard it. Mm-hmm. That should have been the cue to say, all right, let's 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 really revisit what we're doing here because we're getting to a crucial part in the season, and the last thing we want to do is become stale and predictable. And that's yeah. exactly what they were. Did right. you know north of 50% of Jalen Hurts' pass attempts only went to A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Did you know that? Yeah, I, and, and you can look at that a couple of different ways. Dallas Goddard did miss a good amount of time, but he should have gotten – remember, they couldn't – at least the first three games, they they hardly targeted him at all. I, I'll, I'll say longer longer than that. They were inconsistent when it came to being able to get him involved. They were very yeah. inconsistent, and they showed an – they, they almost showed an inability to. At first, it seemed like an unwillingness. That's what it looked like at first. Mm-hmm. But then it looked like an, an, an inability to be able to get it done. Right. Yeah. And then also uh, when it comes to A.J. Brown's targets specifically, he had 158 targets. Jalen Hurts had. Let me make sure I got this number right. He had 538 attempts. 29 percent, almost almost 30 percent of Jalen Hurts' pass attempts went to A.J. Brown. I think that has to change. Yeah. I think they need to be more balanced in their offensive attack and they need to do a better job of getting um, wide receiver three involved, getting their tight end involved. I think they need to improve in that realm because the more options you have on offense, the more unpredictable um, you become. Right. And I think that's also on the GM to get Jalen a better three and four than Alameda Zacchaeus and Quez Watkins. That's not acceptable either. They they were terrible with depth this year yes. on the, at the receiver spot, at the tight end spot, at a bunch of spots on the defensive side of the ball. And that's, that's on the GM. They got to be better, you know, plain and simple. Uh, all right, let's uh, step aside. We'll come back, um, give you a little uh, NFL stuff, uh, a nice gesture out of a really just awful situation, uh, update on a couple quarterbacks. Some teams, like the Niners and the Chiefs, who have some really difficult financial situations to deal with, and we will also do our AFC power rankings as well. We will do 10 through 1 with that uh, when we get back. So uh, don't go anywhere, Tone and Rob, on this Friday. We are Sports Take. I want to tell you right now about Flynn Tree Services. Yes, Flynn Tree Services is an experienced, licensed, and insured Pennsylvania tree services company that will trim or remove any unwanted trees off of your property. They offer cost-effective solutions to any tree problem that you may face, and they are experts at trimming all types of trees, and they serve southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey and Northern Delaware. They specialize in tree removal, stump grinding, as well as tree pruning. You could go to their Facebook or Instagram uh, page for more information or a sampling of their work. Give Flynn Tree Services a call at 610-850-2848. 610-850-2848 or online at flynntreeservices.com. That's flynntreeservices.com. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers, go for the hit and the hits, go for the stakes and the stakes, go to get your parlay on, go to get your party on, go for the scene, go for the screens, go for the gallery, go for the win, go to ocean, visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. We're back. That's Tone. I'm Rob. We're Sports Steak. Let's hit the like button if we could. Friends, let's talk some NFL, Tone. All right. Uh, the big story today nationally is Jimmy Garoppolo. He was handed down a two-game suspension, and that two-game suspension basically cost him $11.25 million as the Raiders mm. have cut him uh, with cause uh, for violating the league's uh, performance-enhancing uh, a substance abuse policy. Um, so it's related to Garoppolo using a prescribed medication without having a valid therapeutic use exemption from the league. I guess some guys can use it who, who have the exemption. He can't. Um, mm, so the, do, you, do, you, do you think they dosed him <laughs> to get rid of the, the $11 million, a lot of the money to get up? Conspiracy the theories uh, begin. But yeah, so sources uh, said the Raiders are expected to release him before the fifth day of the new league year, which is mid-March, where he would earn that $11.25 million bonus. Man, they they saw that that opening and they they ran through it like, uh, you know, they're going to bust off a 100-yard run. Yeah, he signed hey, a listen, Can you blame him, though? No. No, three years, $72.75 million contract, which included $33.75 million guaranteed in Vegas in this past March um, when, you know, Josh McDaniels was still there. Dave Ziegler was still there as the general manager. Needless to say, a lot has changed. New GM, new head coach, and now Garoppolo out of there. So he's, I, I think Jimmy's made a few bucks in his, in his life. He'll be all right, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hopefully, man. Um, he, he, he was smart with his money. You, you, you would like to think so. Yeah. Uh, but listen, I can't blame the Raiders at all. Besides they're trying to turn the page anyway. So I'm yeah. not even, I'm not he even wasn't going to start for them. He, he lost yeah, the yeah, job yeah. anyway last year. Right. He lost the job anyway. It was no way he was in their long-term plans. In other words, this kind of just expedited what was already in, uh, inevitable. Yeah. But it helps them cap wise. I mean, that's a big, Absolutely. you get 11 points. Win, win. Back. Yeah. It's a win-win. It is. All right. Um, this is a nice gesture. We we know, uh, you know, the shooting at, at the parade for the Chiefs, which occurred on Wednesday. And uh, the good news is only one of the children who was at the the, the local uh, Kansas City Children's Hospital is still there. Everyone else has been treated and and sent home as far as the children go. So that's good. Um, but we do know that the there was a woman who lost her life, and she's a mother of two. And Taylor Swift donated a hundred thousand uh, dollars in a GoFundMe for her and her family. So, which is a nice gesture there for sure. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And they think the, the crazy thing is they think this was the result of just, you know, two guys. Well, I don't know if it's two, but 
just some kind of dispute at the time at the at the parade. Like it wasn't one of these deals. At least this is what they think. This is their working theory, where somebody set out to go there and just open a fire. Right, Apparently, right, right. there was a, you know, some kind of beef and whatever it started. It's like I, I don't I would, care what the situation is. Right. It's just a disgrace. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was one of those situations where you know it's a lot of people. People are bumping to each other, all that kind of stuff, stepping on each other's feet, whatever it may be. Um, maybe other people aren't. Other people maybe someone's in someone's way whatever it is something trivial yeah good way to hey, put it hey f you no f you hey what yep. you want to do what, what yep. you trying to do mm -hmm. bop, bop. it don't take much i've seen it happen in person no uh, right it, 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 it doesn't take much you got to make sure you got to dodge that, that's 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 a ter again terrible situation um completely avoidable this is what happens when ego meets the wrath of man and you know, somebody lost their life because of it. Mm -hmm. Children, are, a lot of children are going to be scarred for life. And um, this is something that the NFL is definitely going to revisit. Um, you know, we briefly broached it yesterday. I wouldn't be surprised if the league completely shifts how they handle these parades. I wouldn't be surprised if these cities, you know, you know, say to themselves, "All right, we're not, the parade thing just can't, it just can't happen. It yeah. can't happen anymore. But it's going to be it's going to be a, in a controlled environment. You know, we you know we thought about you know these." Uh, Glorified pep rallies at the, you know at the stadium. Yeah, well, yeah, we're we're going to be at Lincoln Financial Field, and people will speak, and everybody will have you know whatever, and that's all it's mm -hmm. going to be. And you're going to yeah. have a ticket, and you're going to go through the same security measures that you go through to go to a game. You know, right, right, right. Maybe maybe they dress it up, and you know, maybe um, pay some people to perform. You know, it could it could open up a whole new generation of how people celebrate Super Bowls. Um, but Casey. Those people at KC, not all of you guys, because a lot of you guys are good citizens, but those individuals who were in, involved in that shooting, you ruined it for the lot. Yep. Yep. Senseless. Just absolutely senseless. All right. Um, Geno Smith, uh, unlike Jimmy G, Geno Smith is going to get paid. Uh, he will be getting a $12.7 million bonus, which will bring him up mm. to $22.5 million guaranteed for the 2024 season uh, for Seattle. Seattle's going to be an interesting team to watch. You know, new, a lot of changes there, coaching changes, all those kind of things. Uh, Gino took a little bit of a step back last year. He was hurt too. Mm -hmm. but what do they do at quarterback? Are they going to? With, will they make it a priority to draft a guy relatively high, uh, knowing Gino's getting up there a little bit? You know, Drew Locke, they do have an okay backup. We saw that against the Eagles. Um, but is that or is that something you just hold off for another year on? Man. Uh... If I'm the if I'm the Seahawks, I'm definitely drafting a quarterback this year. Yeah, I'm definitely drafting one without a doubt. I don't care if it's in the second round, whatever. Like I'm drafting one because at the very least, Geno could probably buy you another season of developing that guy. See, this is this is this is a very this is a prime um, situation that the Seahawks are in. They can either make the right, they can either end up on the right side of it, or they can screw it up tremendously. Mm -hmm. I think they should draft the quarterback in the second round. Um, let him sit behind Geno. Gino knows what's coming. He knows he wasn't the franchise quarterback. He knows he's a he's a, he's a bridge, and he just so happened to be really productive. And he managed to earn some more money in that regard. And he's right now he's um, he he managed to, he he managed to resurge his career. He's in the twilight of it, um, but he knows he's not the long term answer. That organization knows, and if they're smart, they're just in the quarterback within the first three rounds. Yeah, I would I would think we'd see it relatively high. I, I do. Um, I, I think that's certainly the case um, with them. But yeah, they got to they got to do some things. That's for sure. Um, let's talk about the Niners and let's talk about the Chiefs. Let's start with San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So they have some decisions to make here on, on some guys. Uh, one of them being Brandon Ayuk. So he's entering the he, his fifth year option. Okay, off of his first his rookie deal, off of his mm -hmm. first uh, deal in the NFL. So he's eligible for an extension. Right now, he will make if if nothing happens, fourteen point one in twenty twenty four. To me, he's a better receiver than Debo. Debo doesn't stay on the field enough. That's a good Ayuk, point. Ayuk's better, as far as I'm concerned. But you got a lot of money tied up in that offense. McCaffrey makes a ton at the running back position. The only break that you have is Purdy. But you know, there's a lot of other guys making a good amount of money. Kittle, uh, Debo, Trent Williams. Like, you know, we could go on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm really interested to see what ends up happening there uh, with him, if they can get something done with him this year, because he is, you know, he said, I like, I like being there, but I also want to get paid. He's not, he's not trying to give you a hometown discount, which I don't blame him. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know when you see the, the way his uh his people who is acting, is acting on social media and all that kind of stuff and whatnot, he, and you think about his post as well, you know, saying I remember what got you there or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you 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 bring up you bring up a very 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 good point. Um, here's the thing, man. Like you you said something that really stood out to me: the fact that Ayuk he was more available. And more productive for you at the end of the day, you know. Um, I you what, what, what he put up? He had uh, he played in 16 games, had uh, 105 targets on 1300 yards receiving. He averaged a almost, lot of receive that's a 1300, it's a good year, yeah. He averaged almost 18 yards of reception, with yeah, seven, with, with uh, seven receiving touchdowns, yeah. And then, and then when you think about what Debo Samuel provided you, right? And you know, obviously, they they, they use him in a myriad of ways, but. And in, 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 in reality, Debo Samuel, when it comes when it comes to production at the receiver position, I mean, look, he, he gave you 15 games, and on 89 targets, 892 receiving yards, seven receiving touchdowns, he gave you that. Averaged almost 15 yards of reception. Those numbers aren't terrible, when, but but when you consider what they're paying him, you would like more production from Debo Samuel. Yeah. Um, and also the health factor is a big deal, and they just gave Debo that contract too. Yep. And uh, granted, they were smart. It's only a three year extension, a three year deal. He's entering the second year of the deal and they have a potential out going into the 2025 season, yeah. um, which will only lead to a fifteen point one million dollar dead cap hit. It's a lot of money still. But regardless, though, um, if, I, if, if I'm the, if I'm the San Francisco 49ers, I'm already considering life without Debo. You're going to have to they're going to have to restructure some people. Um, I don't know if. You know, if it's McCaffrey, I don't know if it's I, I don't know, but somebody's going to have to restructure, I, I think, for them to be able to do what they think they have to do here because they're paying. Um, if I was them, ton. yeah, if I was them, some people may not agree with this, but if I was them, I'm trading Debo, try to maximize his value now because, in my opinion, his value is not going to go up. Yeah, because because especially with that injury history, that's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. Um, if if if, I, if I'm the Niners, I'm paying Ayuk. I'm trading Debo, and I'm drafting another Robert, and I'm drafting an, another receiver and getting younger there. So I have another receiver on a rookie deal. You still got CMC, who has proven to be the catalyst of everything you do offensively. You still got Kittle. Um, now I'm not sure what Kittle's contract situation is, but overall, I would totally move on from Debo, lean harder on Ayuk, and uh, bring in a younger guy to play alongside Ayuk. Really lean on Kittle and CMC. Because especially when you think about the Brock Purdy contract coming up, I mean he's entering the third. He's going to be entering the third year of his rookie deal, but mm -hmm. he doesn't have a fifth year option. So they're going to have to make a decision whether or not they're going to extend him, especially after, uh, especially after this season, because I doubt him and his representation want to go into the season uh, on the lame duck contract. Yeah, I think you're right on that. All right, and then the Chiefs are in a a a you know an equal kind of situation. So. The difference there is they're paying Mahomes a ton as opposed to Purdy who isn't getting anything, but he's not just the only one getting paid. But they have mm -hmm. two free agents in on the defensive side in Chris Jones uh, and uh, Ladarius Sneed. They, they have two guys who are massive parts of their team who could who are both, you know, wanting to get paid. I, I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know how they're going to get deals done with both of those guys. They have a they have a they have a good amount of guys actually. Yeah, um, on defense yeah, that, that, that they have to really think about. Um, and look, you got Patrick Mahomes. He he buys you a lot of flexibility. Yeah, but you know, you said Chris Jones, right? Legereus Sneed. Um, are they going to are they going to maintain Willie Gay, a young linebacker, twenty six years old, who's in, who's increased his market value? Um, he was making about a million, one point two million. You know, with the uh, with the Chiefs, mm -hmm. his 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 market value has skyrocketed to about seven million per season. Mm -hmm. Estimate estimated. So. You know, Willie Gay is going to be looking to get paid this offseason. Um, the linebacker free agent market isn't as vast, so he'll, he may, he'll, he's going to have a lot. He's going to have a big market. You're right. He's go, he's going to have a lot of suitors, especially with the way he played um, in that Super Bowl and just throughout the season. So they're going to have to make them, make some decisions there. Also, are they going to bring back McCole Hartman? Right, he caught the game winning touchdown. Are they going to bring back him? Right, you know what's uh, what's what's he going to be looking for? Mm -hmm. um, he's only 25 years old. Um, Clyde Edward Tiller, running back. Um, do they want to bring him back, you know, to be behind um, um, Isaiah Pacheco, who supplanted him as a, as a starting running back, right? Drew Tranquil, their, 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 their starting middle linebacker, a guy they brought in in free agency. Um, I believe I believe they brought him in on a one-year deal. Yep, a one-year 
uh, $3 million deal. Um, he's 28 years old. He had a really great season. He's mm-hmm. looking to re-up. So they're going to have to make some decisions at that linebacker position. Um, they mm-hmm. still have Nick Bolton, obviously, on a rookie deal. But eventually, he's going to um, come up as well. But overall, look, when you got Patrick Mahomes, it definitely buys you a lot of wiggle room. But at the same time, you want to do your best to keep that defense as stout as possible. Yeah. Uh, so keep your eye on on all of those developments. How about this? The overtime that they played in the Super Bowl, and it went almost an entire overtime. But uh, estimated that CBS made in commercials just for the overtime alone, not the broadcast, 60 mm-hmm. Million six zero million just in overtime. Jeez, oh my god! Hey, listen, quick um, sidebar. I'm sorry. I, I, I want to divert back. Just one, one more thing with you. Remember, remember how you mentioned Legarius Sneed and how he's due to get paid? Yeah. So listen to this, and this might blow your mind here. So uh, he was an older. He was an older rookie. You know what I mean? He's on. He's only three. He's, only, he's 27, but he's been in the league only three years. Um, listen to this though, and also by the way, um. The four-year contract that he was on, the four-year rookie deal that he was on, which is three point, which is worth in total three point nine million over a four-year span. Did you know his average salary was only nine hundred and eighty-two thousand? What a and, bargain, man! What a and steal. only and only six hundred thirty-four thousand of the contract was guaranteed. No, I didn't know that. Guess what his market value is now? Just guess. Twenty-two. Twenty-two million per season. Eighteen per season. Uh, Sixteen. Sixteen point three. Okay. Which is which, nice which, which is more than what I believe Darius Slay is making right now. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's going to get. He's I'll be honest paid. with you. Yeah. He's going to be gone. They'll they'll bring back Chris Jones. Sneed. He be might he might be gone. Legarius yeah. Sneed might be gone because if his market value is that, and the cornerback free agent market right now, let's 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 just take a quick gander at it because this this is all fascinating to me. Um, as of right now, the free agent market when it comes to cornerbacks. It's not that vast. Um, you got Adore Jackson, Kendall Fuller, Stefan Gilmore, um, a lot of older Michael guys. Davis, Jeff Akuda. You know, you got older guys, right? Um, Emmanuel Mosley, CJ Henderson, Jordan Lewis from the uh, he played with the Cowboys and the Bengals before. You got Steven Nelson, who had a really good year with Houston. Um, you got some OGs, but 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 when you but when you think about age and um ability to win and, and and also come from a winning situation i you can make an argument legere you, you, we, we can make a legitimate argument that legerious need might be the most valuable free agent cornerback on the market we can make a legitimate argument for that yeah and he may end up making north of 17 million dollars he's out of there i think he's i don't out think of- he comes back their problem too is, you know, defensive tackles now get in the in the twenties. Mm-hmm. Hargrave did. I bet I bet Chris Jones is a little bit younger than Hargrave. Not a ton, but maybe a year or so. I mean, he's gonna um, get he's gonna get Chris, 22. Chris Jones is twenty nine. I bet you Hargrave's uh, J- thirty. Jamal Hargrave. Let's see here. Javon Hargrave is. 31. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, close, but a little bit younger. And he, so Hargrave, get, has, yeah, yeah. Hargrave has an average salary of $21 million, And Chris Jones is better than Javon Hargrave. Yes. So, at 29, Chris Jones' estimated market value, his estimated market value is $28.4 million per season. 28? 28. So th- they may not be able to bring either one of those guys back. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Unless you do some really creative accounting and, and, and go nuts uh, on, a, on a signing bonus or spread it out or, or do the dummy years and all the other stuff that, that Howie seems to always do. Yeah, and they, they, they only have about $23 million in cap space. So they're going to have to get really creative. Um, as of right now, Aaron Donald is the highest paid DT by far at thirty-one point six million. Then it drops to twenty-four million with Quentin Williams, Jeffrey Simmons at twenty-three point five million per season, Deron Payne twenty-two point five, Dexter Lawrence twenty-one point eight, DeForest Buckner twenty-one million, Javon Hargrave twenty-one, Chris Jones right now is at nineteen point five million. He's going to eclipse Quentin yeah. Williams. Yeah, because he I, to me he's got three, four stellar years still left in him. 
Like he's right. that good. Exactly. Yeah. He de- he definitely has about yeah like three at least three legitimate quality years because he doesn't to me he doesn't look like he's slowing down. No. If he can if, if he can get a three year a three year deal from somebody a three year deal from somebody if they're paying him north of twenty five million dollars he's going to get that. Mm-hmm. He's definitely going to get that. Now the question becomes: Are the Chiefs going to prioritize him? Are they going to pr- prioritize Snead? I think they have a higher propensity to prioritize Jones than Snead. Uh, yes, unless because they're deeper when it comes to their DBs. Again, you got Trent McDuffie back there. You got Justin Reed. Yeah, you know all that kind of stuff. So it's just no. I got you. I got, got some you. decisions to make. All right, uh, two juveniles charged in the shooting uh, at the per- at the Chiefs parade. Wow, uh, the news release out. Yeah, charged with crimes connected to the shooting. Um, they're going to charge them as adults without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt, all right. Uh, gun related resisting, among other stuff. Uh, anticipate these charges with respect to the future. Yeah, so that's cotton. There isn't a ton right now. We we talked about the the, the woman who passed away. Um, she was a mother of two, 22 other people were injured. Um, uh, victims range from eight to 47 years old, and half were under the age of 16 but all but one of them has been released from the children's hospital. But so that's uh, kind of where it's at right now. Yeah. Hey, you, 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 you ever heard that song about Akon? Which one? Up, they won't let me out. Yeah. It's, yeah. O- it's over. That's it's over. over for them. Yep. I agree. And it was nice. Patrick Mahomes and his wife went in to, to visit one of the, one of the little girls who got, you know, got shot. So, uh, yeah. All right. So uh, we did it yesterday. So let's follow up today with our rankings here. And this is the AFC power rankings. We did the NFC yesterday. You want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Let's do it. All right, let's so, go 10 um, to 1. I'll work our way up. All right, cool. So um, at my 10 spot, I have the Colts. Uh, my 9 spot, the Steelers. 8, the Jags. 7, Dolphins. 6, Browns. 5, Texans. Four Bengals, three Bills, two Ravens, one the Super Bowl champions, the Chiefs. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll give you mine, and then we'll run through it. Uh, and uh, we're we, we have some similarities, but it's not like yesterday where it was exactly right. The same. Right, the AFC's harder. I knew today we wouldn't be matching up. I knew. Yeah. That. Uh, all right, number ten. I have the Jags. I have them at ten. I have the Colts at nine. I have the Steelers at eight. I have the Dolphins at seven. I have the Bengals at six. I have the Texans at five, Browns at four, Bills at three, Ravens at two, Chiefs at one. All right. Can you run through your list one more time for me? Ten Jags, nine Mm -hmm. Colts, eight Steelers, seven Dolphins, six Bengals, five Texans, four Browns, three Bills, Two Ravens, one Chiefs. Now, right. let me give you re- my reasoning for a couple of these. The Bengals, if Burrow's healthy, he gets moved. They get moved up. They 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 jump into that four spot. We don't. Okay. I, I'm. I want to see what Deshaun Watson looks like next year to go with that really good defense and some other players that they have. But I think the Browns are really dangerous. Texans, mm. was it? Are you going to come back to earth a little bit next year? Colts, are you going to come back to earth a little bit next year? Who's playing quarterback for the Steelers? Can the Dolphins show that they're more than just a front running team? Where if they get up, yeah, they can put seventy on you. If not, they don't. They don't. In my opinion, the Dolphins lack a toughness right now. Agreed. Um, you and I have the Dolphins at the same exact spot, seven. Yeah, and you know the the Chiefs and the Ravens. The, the biggest thing for the Ravens is Lamar Jackson's got to show up in a, in a in a huge playoff game. Yeah. Um. And and same thing with Buffalo. Can you ever get over the hump here? That that's huge. That's huge. You know. So our our one through three, our one through three is exactly the same. Yeah. Our five, our five and seven spots are exactly the same. See, here's the good thing about this list, though. Our one through ten have the same exact teams in it. Yeah. Right. Our four. And our six spots are swapped. I view the Bengals a little higher than the Browns. Yeah. You view the Browns a little higher than the Bengals. Is it is, is it be, is it be, is it because of is it because of that defense that Browns defense? 
It's because of their defense, and I think they're very well coached, and I think they're well run too. I think they have a good front yeah. office. I, I I would I would agree with that. I think I put the Bengals over the Browns, and again, our we both have Texans at five. You and yeah. I are rating the Texans very fairly. Mm-hmm. Um, I have the Bengals over the Browns because I trust their quarterback position more than I trust the Browns. Yes. Now yeah. both quarterbacks have dealt with inju- have dealt with injuries, um, uh, in the twenty twenty three season. But when I think about the weapons Joe Burrow has, when they're hitting on all cylinders, that defense plays very well. They play fast. The Bengals defense actually doesn't get enough credit that they deserve. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that Chiefs defense. People overlooked it for a while until everything came together. That Bengals defense is is much better than I I think people give them credit for. I think the Bengals are also well coached. I think um, Zach Taylor did an amazing job coaching around um, losing Joe Burrow. Um, Obviously, you know, it fell off a cliff because you're still dealing with a backup quarterback. But um, I feel like they ultimately maximized that roster the best of their, the best of their ability. But I just think when I think about um, Joe Burrow and Deshaun Watson, I'm betting on Joe Burrow more than I am um, Deshaun Watson right now. Um, we both got the Dolphins in the seventh spot. Awesome. Now, this is where things are interesting. You know, you have the Colts in the nine spot. I have the Colts in the 10 spot. Not too far off. I have the Jags over both the Steelers and the Colts, mainly because of the stability at the quarterback position. And um, obviously, I think out of those three teams, I think the Steelers have the best coach. But I think the Jags are more – I think the Jags have a really talented defense. The Steelers have a really talented defense too. Um, I think I'm just looking at the quarterback position for all those three teams, and I'm saying to myself, the Jags have a better uh, are in a better situation with that, and, I, and that's why I edged them over the Steelers. And the Colts, Anthony Richardson, we don't know what he's going to be yet coming off the injury. Um, Shane Steichen proved that he he can coach his ass off uh, with limited um, with limited talent at that position. So that's why they're even in the top 10 in the first place. Um, the Steelers, I'll put you like this. The Steelers are a very interesting team because they still won, what, 10 games or 11 games this year? Uh, something like that. They got something in. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. they got in and, and, and they won double-digit games. Look, I'm willing to say this and I'm willing to stand by this take right here. If the Steelers – had or can get their hands on a quarterback, I think Steelers can jump from nine to top four. Yes. Yeah. And I the question is, do I they, firmly believe that. Do they go proven? Do they go draft? Do they, are they going to be in the running for Russell Wilson? Are they going to be running for Kirk Cousins? Are they going to be, you know, uh, who's the other one that could be uh, Justin Fields? Are they going to be in the, in the play for those guys? Or are they going to try and build it through the draft? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I I feel more like they're going to go after somebody already established. I'm glad you I'm glad you I'm glad you went there. Um, the Rooneys have made it very clear they need something to shake this offseason. Yeah, they're 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 thinking about making a swing or taking a swing. Now, the Rooneys aren't the most aggressive franchise, right? The Steelers are not the most aggressive franchise. They're not the most aggressive owners. No, right? they they believe so, in the draft. They believe yeah, I got they, you. they believe in the draft and they believe in yeah. developing guys, uh, and they're patient. Yeah. Although, although, although they want to be aggressive this offseason, I don't think it's going to be reckless aggression. Mm-hmm. Also, also they value flexibility. If knowing what I know about them and their trends and how they can do and how they do business and how they're going to try to balance aggression with a steady hand, and also Tomlin likely will get an extension. And you have these young receivers who are developing, and you got that defense. I think they're more prone to aim for someone who maybe they're not as proven, mm-hmm. but they're younger. The ceiling is really high, and they're going to be supremely coachable. I think Justin Fields becomes I think Justin Fields will be the Steelers quarterback in 2024. I think the Steelers pulled a trigger on Justin Fields. And also, again, because of him being on the rookie deal, let me make sure I got my numbers right here because Justin Fields right now, I think he's entering, what, year four of the rookie deal or year three? I think it's Let me make sure three. I got this right. I so want Justin, to say three. So Justin Fields, um, he's entering – oh, okay, wow. He's entering year four. Is it the, fourth? Wow. And he's, he's going to be entering year four of the rookie deal. Um. Right, going because to, he was a first rounder, there's a fifth year option, right? Exactly. So they're going to so whoever has his rights will pick should pick up the fifth year option. Yeah. The I don't think the Bears retain him. So I think the Steelers 
they pulled a the trigger for Justin Fields trade. You have his rights for two seasons if you include the fifth year option at a pretty at a pretty um favorable cap number. You get to develop this guy with Mike Tomlin as with Mike Tomlin as his head coach. He he'll have a defense, he'll have weapons, he'll have a running back, running backs actually, he'll have an offensive line, a prime situation for him to a prime situation for him to develop. And if things don't work out, they can get out and probably draft the quarterback in 2026. Mm. Yeah. And move on. I think that I think that ha- I think that situation has the highest ceiling and the greatest deal of flexibility in case things work out. All right. All right. Interesting. All right. Let's uh let's step aside for our final break and let's come back. We'll do some NBA. Doc Rivers crushing it as usual. Uh we'll get into that. A bunch of other things uh, coming up for the weekend. Circle back to some birds as well. Don't go anywhere. Tony Shields, Rob Ellis, Sports Take, right back. I remember getting my heart broken when they lost the Super Bowl in 2004. We're big Eagles fans. We moved to South Philly because of the Eagles. When they won... We went straight to Broad Street, and uh, everybody was going nuts over there, and it was just a, a memory that you'll never forget. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, We've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. They're carving up a good play calling along the way. First and goal at the six. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Final segment of this Friday. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so a couple things, Tone. Let's start yeah. with this one. Oh, oh buddy. Real quick, Rob, really quick, my friend. Yes. Really quick. Really quick. You know how we ended that segment talking about the AFC and moves that the Steelers could potentially make, right? Yeah. So really quick, it's not going to take long at all. I, I dug a little further about the Steelers' financial situation, right? Mm -hmm. Did you know they're currently, right now, $4.3 million over the cap? Oh, they're over. Over the cap. Wow. So, I'm, so I don't know how plausible a free agent like Kirk Cousins or even Russell Wilson is. Unless, feel, unless there's some, you know, heavy, heavy people departing. Uh, right, 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 right. And but that's the that's the cap going into 2024. Right. So they're going to either probably have to move some money around, restructure, make some trades. But financially, fields can be the best option and could yield the most results as well. Just yeah, a, the, just, just a thought. No, you're right. The toughest one would be Cousins um, because he is a free agent. He's got mm -hmm. a very good agent. He will command. Still, even at this point in his career, pretty good bucks. Uh, and he has gotten guaranteed money. His last two contracts from the Vikings were both guaranteed money when it wasn't as in fashion as it is, you know, now in the NFL. So Fields mm -hmm. does make more sense financially. The only the only difference is with Fields, you have to give stuff up with mm -hmm. cousins. That's it's true just, too. That's it's true just too. money, right? Um that's a good point. So I guess if you if you're really jammed up money wise in your Pittsburgh, your move is actually draft somebody. That just, part just straight too. up draft them. Yeah, that, you know, that, that's, that's, second round, third round. You know, you see see which of the you know highlight guys, Caleb Williams and Drake May, and those guys after they're gone, then whoever may still be around in the second or third round is the direction you go. Although, you know, you just kind of went down that road two years ago where you got pick it late in the first round and it didn't really work out for you. So. Right. At, right. <laughs> at the very least, here, that's the thing at the very least, if you're not completely enamored, because remember in that draft, let's be honest, that quarterback draft sucked. It was, and terrible. they just, and they pretty much just drafted the the best guy of the worst. And yeah. they, they, and it wasn't the highest draft pick, but they, they didn't, they didn't have to draft that man. So to your point, if you're not completely thrilled with this draft class, you look at Justin Justin Fields, who's played in the league for three seasons and has shown you an ability to play at a pretty high level to an extent. You put him in a situation with the Steelers. You know, you move some money around. You probably you probably bring in some more things around him. I think Justin Fields makes the most sense financially and gives them, gives them the most flexibility if, if it doesn't pan out. Well, I just think also, too, what you have to take into account if you're – if you're them, okay, mm -hmm. you're close. Mm -hmm. You have TJ Watt. You have, you know, really good established players on that. Cameron Hayward, guys who aren't getting any younger. Mm -hmm. Mika Fitzpatrick, blah, blah, blah. You, you got guys on that side of the ball who can play. You need to maximize that now. You know, I, I think that's something else to keep in mind. Like, do you want to take a chance on the unproven draft pick Versus somebody but a little bit more established, even if you're paying out a little bit more. Right. Fields may be the perfect in between. He yeah. Be perfect what in what between. do you think? I mean, what's he going to command? In terms of um, what's Chicago going to want back is what I mean. Like, how, they're, not getting first, they're not getting a first rounder. I don't think they are either. At most, at the very most, they get a second. Yeah. Second and something else thrown in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the most, they get a second. Maybe you throw in. I don't know. You get a second, maybe you throw in Kenny Pickett and something else. I don't know. Like, but they're not getting a first round pick. No, no. But That's done. yeah. Well, so it's them. What's Atlanta going to do? Could Atlanta be in the Justin Field sweepstakes? Right. That's true. Now here's the thing about Atlanta. Atlanta, they have significantly more money. They have twenty nine point eight million in cap space, so they can afford. They could probably afford a Kirk Cousins contract if they move if they move some stuff around. Hmm. Um, Fields obviously fits in their situation. Um, both teams have an average age of 26. So both teams are relatively young. Okay. You know, we're going to see this is going to be a very interesting offseason. Fields ends up in either Atlanta or Pittsburgh. Book it. Well, let's throw another. I team say Pittsburgh, out. though. I'm willing to say Pittsburgh, though. Cousins walks. What, what are the Vikings doing? That's a good question. Because you're already you already got to think about paying Justin Fields. I mean, not Justin Fields, Justin Jefferson. 
Yeah. yeah. If you are, are you going to pay Justin Jefferson? And if you do, you better hope you got an answer at quarterback. Because me personally, if I'm an organization, I'm not paying a wide receiver, in, a wide receiver Tyreek Hill money at thirty million dollars, and I don't have a quarterback. Somebody throwing the ball. I'm not yeah. doing it. Yeah. I'd much yeah. rather trade him. Right. Yeah. It's fundamentally flawed to have a great weapon like that. It's like you never taking the car out of the garage. You know what I mean? So it's like having a Ferrari. With, it's, like, it's like having a, a Ferrari with no engine in it. Yeah. No, it is. It is. So I think they're um, they're another team. Just to watch because we don't talk about them as much, but they're kind of floating out there. Uh, anybody feels, else? Fields to Minnesota sounds interesting too, doesn't it? Yeah. Fields, Justin Jefferson with the, with that with that running dynamic Fields brings. You got T.J. Hawkinson at tight end. You got Jordan Addison at receiver as well in the rookie deal. Yeah. Minnesota is interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. So yeah, because it feels could, like the feel- right guy, and they're they're right back on track. You know, and I and I, I think Kevin O'Connell's oh. a good offensive coach still. So could Fields end up in Minnesota, Atlanta, or Pittsburgh? Yeah, any of the above, really. Because if you think about the other teams like Washington uh, and some of the other teams that are picking really high, they're going to draft a quarterback. They're, I don't think they're in the market for Justin Fields. Mm. It's the it's the teams that are picking further down that are maybe a little bit more established. They're going to be in 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 the right. field in the market. Mo- Monica says New England. Here's why I don't say New England because they draft so high. What they're picking in the top five? Yeah, third, third or fourth. I I would look at New England as drafting a guy before they make the move for Justin Fields because they're drafting so high. Here, like New England is sitting pretty decently because I see everything is so contingent on on Chicago. If mm-hmm. Chicago keeps Fields, they're not drafting a quarterback, right? Which means and Washington backs, probably, yeah, right? Washington would get could get first tra- uh, crack at, at Caleb. whoever Caleb or you know whatever. Which you get the tie there to uh, Kingsbury, right? Then if you're New England, you're like, we could get Drake May, or we could get uh, Jaden Daniels, or we get one of these other guys, whatever. Mm-hmm. They're probably just going to wait on it if that's the case, and then grab whichever guy hasn't been taken. Uh, uh, if you like them that much, where's Minnesota drafting? Minnesota didn't make the playoffs. They're not as high as New England in those teams. And you said Jaden Daniels, right? Hold on, I'll pull up the draft. Over. Minnesota's drafting. Oh, they had pick eleven. Could Minnesota draft the LSU quarterback to pair with their LSU wide receiver? Yeah, they didn't play together, but yeah, they could. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I mean that's possible. I, the I don't. Options I, are endless. Yeah, and again, the hard part right now until – and this could come down draft night. Not knowing Chicago's a wild card, you know. Uh, Just for for everybody's edification, Bears are are first. That's with the trade that they made with Carolina. Then Washington's two, New England's three. Arizona's not taking a quarterback. They're four. That does that not if I'm them, I don't care. I'm taking Marvin Harrison Jr. all day. Yeah, if, but, if he's there, I'm taking either Marvin Har- if, if I'm, t- I'm taking Marvin Harrison Jr. if he's there. If he's not there, if he's not there, I'm taking Brock Byers. Yeah, the tight end. Yep. Yeah. Uh out of Georgia. Five is not taking a quarterback. That's the Chargers. Uh if I'm the Giants, I'm thinking long and hard. Uh about a quarterback at if six. I'm the Giants, I'm drafting one of those quarterbacks. I'm sitting him the first year. Yep. And I'm getting and I'm getting my money's worth out of, out of Daniel Jones. There's no way I'm letting him there's no way I'm benching Daniel Jones and I'm paying him that money. So um I'm 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 taking the hit this year. I'm drafting a quarterback, letting him sit behind Daniel Jones and let him watch the game. Yep. And then I'm throwing him in in twenty twenty five and we're rocking out like that. Seven's not taking a quarterback. That's the Titans. They took Levis last year. Eight is the Falcons. We just talked about them. They could be in play to draft. They could be in play to trade. Nine mm-hmm. is the Bears. The Bears, that's their second pick. So uh, that could be anything. That mm-hmm. could be a lot of different things there for them. I think I think they go defense with that pick. Yeah, o, or O-line, either one. But yeah, Or good. O-line, yeah, good point. The, the, uh, the tackle depth in this White draft is out of there. Yeah, and so they could, they could go there. Ten is the Jets. Now, I wouldn't, if I were them, take a quarterback that high. But they have to start thinking about that. Um, but, you know, they could go a lot of different ways. The Vikings at 11. Jets might go O-line. They could. Yeah, they could. They could very well go O-line. You got uh, Rodgers coming back healthy this time. You can't risk him getting hit again like that. I well, wouldn't be surprised if the Jets go O-line straight up. Let me throw another one in there. 
if if the at twelve, if the Broncos trade Russell Wilson, who's you know he got a five year, two hundred forty two million dollar deal, they could be in line for a quarterback. The Raiders at thirteen could be in line for a quarterback. Your next few Ooh. aren't taking anybody. Listen, yeah. listen to this real quick. Denver has the tough pick, right? Do you see a situation where Denver and Atlanta swap picks and package it with Russell Wilson? Yeah. And Denver moves up to the eight spot. I could and drafts see a quarterback. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. Hmm. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. So there's this a there's a lot of ways this can go. This is fast. Yo, this is going to be a very – Chicago holds the keys to the most entertaining draft we've seen in a while. They absolutely do. We're all at their mercy right now because there's so many I, ripple I effects. I kind of like it. I, I like it too. I think it's cool. Yeah, I think it's very cool. Uh, they, they're they going I, – I, I don't know, man. We had the COO yesterday pra uh, praising uh, Fields. How much of that was just trying to build up his trade value? I don't know, man. I don't yeah, know. listen, he's new. He's a new CEO. That's all that's all bait. That's all smoke. That's all smoke screen. Yeah. At this point in the season, I don't believe anything anyone says. Yeah. Uh all right. So a couple other things. Uh Doc Rivers, the Bucks lost again last night. They're now three and seven with him as the head coach. Three and seven. Uh, and he had a line after the game where he said, quote, We had some guys here, we had some guys in Cabo. So look at it one of two ways. He's calling it good for him for calling guys out who he feels like are mailing it in. Okay. Or two, you're doing everything you can to alienate guys in the five minutes that you've been there. Th this has a, a, a disaster written all over it with, with him. He's three and seven so far. Here's, here's, here's my thing, right? You calling guys out saying they're mailing it in. That begs the question, what was Adrian Griffin doing that made everybody so uncomfortable? What was right. he doing? Dem the demanding the most out of you, making you work hard, holding yeah. you a I'm trying to figure out what was he doing to make everybody so uncomfortable that he deserved to get fired with the with the number one record in the, or the number two record. Maybe in the, just uh, maybe, Adrian Griffin saw this and saw that guys weren't working hard enough, right? Maybe, mm. and that rubbed well, guys the, thing, the wrong though, way. When you trade for Damian Lillard and you know Dame is trying to win the championships, Dame has been avoiding trade talks or trade. Um, uh, he's trades, been denying period, yeah. any kind of trades for his entire career. Yeah, and he preached about trying to bring it to Portland, and obviously he knew he came to his wits end with that. Yeah. You think you think he's the one mailing it? Not you, but yeah. like I know he's not the one mailing it in. No, no, I, I know he's say. not. Mm -hmm. I know Giannis isn't. That's not how Giannis works. Yeah. So who's mailing? Who who are they talking about? Who is he talking about? Chris Middleton doesn't strike me as that kind of guy. That's just me. right. He's kind of a self-made, you know, right. worked his way up the hard way. Worked his way up to becoming one of the top wing players in the league. I don't know. Is it, is it Brooke Lopez? I, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of guys like who are who are critical to the team. Uh, Malik Beasley, uh, Bobby Portis. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard. To, is a gamer. I don't. I have a hard time believing it's him. The way he, the way, the way he. Yeah, he's a hustler. He plays, so, uh, he's yeah, a hustler. I, I, I Who is he talking about? I don't know. I mean, clearly, and he. This is the first time he's broached this. By the way, he he talked about it the other night. I mean, he he's he's been he's almost in. You know what he's where he's at tone. He knows he's got forty million in his pocket, no matter what. I think he's almost in like bleep it i'm gonna say whatever the hell i want to say because mm -hmm. they're not they're not gonna bounce me they just bounce their other coach yeah they can't afford to they can't afford it he right. he's at least he at the very least he's guaranteed this season yeah but even after that it's he's got like but, 20 each the next two years after that coming to him or something right, right, right something like right. that and, maybe and also and also does does milwaukee want to be on their third head coach in less than no. one year no no, and so that's a maybe, bad look for everybody. So maybe players. when when you got when you have a situation when you have Damian Lillard, uh, Chris Middleton, Giannis Antetokounmpo, like you got guys like that on your roster, and you on your third head coach within a year, within a season. Yeah, something's up. Something's going on over there. Mm -hmm. Something's going on. And somebody's lying. Yeah, yeah, and they don't. Play Adrian Griffin. Defense. I think Adrian Griffin. He coached them well enough to that record. 
Yeah. I, I, I have a hard time believing he was the problem. Well, here's the other thing that they, they played last night, the Grizzlies who were just decimated with injuries, right? I mean, mm -hmm. decimated. Bought, uh, Milwaukee was a 14 and a half point favorite in that game. Milwaukee was supposed to just smash them last night. Exactly. So, all right, they lose. Uh, Clay Thompson has been benched by Steve Kerr, but to his credit last night, he came off the bench and scored 35 in their win over the Jazz. Awesome. I, lo I love seeing stuff like that. You respond. Typically, yeah. some I love seeing a guy respond instead of going to a shell and, and pout. Clay Thompson has been in the league way too long. He's a professional. Um, he trusts Steve Kerr's judgment. Obviously, he wants to start, but Clay Thompson is definitely on the back nine of his mm -hmm. career, probably the back four. Yeah. So um, putting it in that perspective, he may be he may be more valuable to you coming off the bench. You know, you 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 you, you take you take defensive pressure off of him. You take the load of him having to play north of thirty five minutes a game. It, it like when when you when a, a guy like that that's a, that that much of a sharpshooter. Yeah, I probably can optimize his talent way better coming off the bench. I and he right. and he instantly he instantly provides scoring in my second unit. Oh, it's great punch. It's great immediate punch. Uh, coming off the bench. All right, All Star Weekend. We talked about it a little bit. The, the one thing I am looking forward to is watching Maxi play. Yes, you know, I see him running around with those guys with, with the with the elite of the elite. Mm -hmm. uh, that them truly being around him up close and personal, like getting getting you know the the vibe that he brings. I think we're going to hear a lot of really positive stuff, like stories from the national people. Not that people don't know how good he is a player, but they're going to realize what kind of person he is too this week. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. This this is his chance to really, um, kind of stake. I don't want to say stake his claim, but kind of let people know nationally that he's he's here to stay, and to see him with those kind of players, see how he functions within that system. It's going to be really exciting to see. I'm so proud of Tyrese Maxey, man. Yeah, it's fun. I, I, he's the guy that you love is representing your city and your team. You know, it, it, he is just that guy. So a shame Joel isn't there, but you know, there is a little part of me tone. That's like, I'm glad he's not there. You, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I'm glad we're, he, the one thing we're, we're going to be able to say about Embiid to close it out is, you know, if, if he comes back, obviously is that he's going to be very well rested. The yes. question is how much rust rest versus rust there is with him. It's a good point. You know, but at point. least he'll be going in, I think, with with a lot more gas left in the tank than he generally has at this at that time of year. Right. And, and that's 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 the really only positive thing you could take from it. Um, because he's a guy that can get gassed on the back end. Um just make it back, just be healthy, man, and just be a contributor, man. Look, you got Maxi that'll help you. They 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 added more scoring, more shooting. Yeah. Just take your time, my man. Take your time. Just mm -hmm. get into the playoffs because I'm a firm believer that in, in the playoffs in the NBA, seeding hardly matters, in my opinion. I believe once you get in, you know, anybody can lose anybody. We've seen this so yeah. many times. And we've seen the Sixers lose when they had home court advantage. Like exactly. Atlanta, you know? Exactly. Uh, all right. Elsewhere, Rob Manfred, who is the MLB commissioner, will be stepping down in the 2029 season. So I guess he's giving them five more years and five years of notice. Uh, that he's going to be stepping down. You know, we've had the guys who were in place, like Goodell's been in place a long time now. Manfred's been in place a long time now. Uh, Silver, uh, uh, Gary Silver. Bettman and Silver. Silver's, Silver. I think, the least tenured, but he's still yeah, been yeah, around a decent amount of time. When he took over for David Stern when? Stern got sick, right? And then, I or no, he stepped down and then he got he got sick. At, I, bet you, I bet you Silver's been in for at least, at least 12 years. That sounds, that, sounds about, that sounds about right. Yeah. Let me see here. Maybe longer, but I, I think it's about 12. Somewhere around there. Let's see. And he was Stern's right-hand man for a long time, too. So Adam Silver has been the commissioner for 10 years in one day. Okay. Yesterday was a 10-year anniversary. Hmm. All, right, all right. Yeah, I guess so. I, I 12. Dave, wow, David Stern was the commissioner for 30 years. Yeah, man. He was in there a long time. He saw it. He saw it go from, you know, a, a probably the third or fourth league and and just bolt up. He, he his tenure court uh lines up with like Jordan, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh Magic and Bird and a few years in and and, and when the game yep. really skyrocketed and went global. 
it, it really took off. You know, yeah, beyond... David, David Stern became the commissioner, I believe. It says here, February 1st, 1984. Wasn't Jordan drafted in 84? 84, Jordan Barkley, Clyde Drexler, Hakeem Olajuwon were all in that draft. That lines up exactly. David Stern is one of is is, is the mind behind, is, is the brain behind you know to, uh building the NBA around Michael Jordan's yeah. um you know stardom. Yep. It was it, it was it went global. It was the dream team playing in the Olympics which helped spur the the global growth and all that. So yeah. Uh that's that doesn't surprise me. But anyway, so yeah, uh Manfred stepping down. Uh he's been a controversial commissioner for sure, but I will give him this. He did a great thing with the pitch clock, man. And, you know, tap, uh, cap, tap, uh, tip to him for that one because I think it really helped the game of baseball, and I think it brought a lot more people in last year who were maybe casuals. Yeah, yeah you know? definitely. Also, let me ask you this, right? You know, yep. okay, so that's the one thing that we can say he brought to the table that helped the MLB. What do you think is his biggest? I don't. What do you think is his biggest failure? throughout his tenure when it came to the MLB and marketing it and so on and so forth. What do you think has been his biggest letdown or disappointment over the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years maybe? Um, That's a good question. Uh, Bud Selig was before him. He kind of turned a blind eye to PEDs. I don't what, blame Manford as for much. When did Manford take over? I want to say he took over in like the – he's probably been in place for – Close to 20 years. I would say around 05. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, no, wait, wait. No, it wasn't. No, because because Bud Selig was the commissioner when the Phillies won in 08. I'll say he took over around 12, 2012. No, 2012. Okay, so all right, where are we here? That's just a guess. Okay, so. Hmm, this timeline is a little off. Let's see here. All right. Manfred, right? Yeah. Where are we here? Okay, so he took over in 2015. All right. Yeah. 2015. Close. So from so from 2015 up until now, um, what his biggest accomplishment might be the pitch clock, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, without a doubt, that's his biggest uh Okay. His biggest okay. Look, we'll see. Look, we'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. We got it either way. Yeah, we got to go. Yeah, but all right. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, uh, listen, though, we'll see how thing. We'll see how this thing pans out, man. Everybody in the chat, everybody streaming, everybody listening. Have yourself a great weekend. Yep. Great uh, show, Rob. Chill, Hell of a show. Can. Great job, Tone. All week, as always, and uh, we'll be back hanging with you guys on Monday uh, at eleven. So everybody, don't go anywhere because you have the National Football Show with Dan Cilio and Tone. So have a great weekend, friends. We will see you on Monday. We are Sports Day. Thanks.